are you, sir? I'm doing good as always, you know, living uh, living good. my best life. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad you uh, decided to say yes to our conversation. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, 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 happy to be here. All right. Um, how how ready are we? Uh, pretty much. Let me just uh, hit a couple things and we'll get this started. Nice. One second. I need to yell at my audience. It's 74,000, not 47, you dumb fucks. You guys see uh, the um, live update count. I see the true view count. Your guys' count doesn't uh, show people who are still viewing the video or people who haven't clicked off the video. My count shows the true count, okay? I see minute-by-minute -minute updates. You see estimates that lag behind, okay? see on my screen uh, a 4 by 4 screen. I'm sorry for yelling at you. That was rude. So, da -da, a 4 by 4 Um... So, I see, like, everybody here. Yeah, Is yeah. There a so way if I you, um, work, just me and click, him? Uh, yeah, Vosh will be, uh, I assume Vosh will be streaming his video in a second. Um, once he is, if you click Oh, on, yeah, I'm uh, live right now, by the way. So let's, uh, let's all take it nice and easy. I know we were sharing SSNs and credit card okay. information before I got in here, but we're going to have to put an end to that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, whenever you can, Vosh, we're going to stream your video. Um, Larry, once he does that, if you just click on his little icon, uh, then uh, it'll show his, his video, and it'll be like you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I'm popping. Oh, okay, well, it... Okay. I can't make it to where it's just me and him? Uh, if you click on his uh, video, you should be able to see it. Um, it'll, it'll blow up his, so that you're just seeing his. Oh, so it'll just be him. Or just be me. Oh, I wanted to be to both of us. All right, I guess it's just it's me and him. It's fine. It'll it'll do. It'll be what it is. All right. So I'm ready if you guys are, and uh, I'll just uh, sit back after this. But uh, yeah, for anyone that's not familiar, real brief introductions. Uh, we've got Vosh and Larry Sharp here. Uh, Vosh, I assume all you guys know uh, is uh, gamer, YouTuber, and libertarian socialist. Larry Sharp. Uh, is a libertarian uh, in 2016 he was gary johnson's running mate no 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 no. Uh, i had tried to be but i lost to, to bill weld oh right wasn't that yes. one vote 31 votes but who's counting i'm not counting okay. you're counting i lost by 31 <laughs> votes yes almost beat bill weld almost all right so uh without any further ado like yeah our discussion here today we were, um larry wanted to discuss libertarian socialism within the Libertarian Party. Do uh, you want to tell us a little bit about where that is, Larry? Where that is? That's an odd question. Um, I don't know. What, what I wanted to talk about was Libertarian Socialism. And the reason why I, was, I wanted to have that conversation is, is that I see where the Libertarian Party is going and where it's been. And I want to have an open dialogue with Libertarian Socialists. And we often, and we often don't. Right. It's 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 we often don't do that well. Um, we're not good. We're not good at that, if that makes any sense. And I'd like us to be better at that. Oh, well, I appreciate that. I don't know where the, the other guy went, but I appreciate the sentiment. Absolutely. I love talking about this. I think that libertarianism is um, is a term that has a lot of associations in people's minds um, and people yeah. are generally um, unwilling to hear out alternate forms of libertarian organization. So I'm more than happy to discuss it. And I appreciate your time. Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm glad that we're having this conversation. In my view, a lot of libertarians are focused on liberty, right? Are focused only on the idea of liberty and freedom. And that's not where I stand, right? When I ran for office, I brought this up and I bring it up often. The idea is I want us to be about happiness, as silly as that sounds. And I really believe that happiness is, it, the best way to get happiness or the pursuit of happiness is to let people be as free as they can possibly be and to pursue happiness to the best of their ability. My policies have never been about abolishing this or abolishing that. They've always been about creating an another alternative to monopoly that is government. And I think whenever you add government, you remove community by default. And so I wanna make sure there are community options for people in the world to be better, to be happier. And 
when I hear people say things like, well, you know, the alt-right is coming into the party or lib socks are coming into the party. If they're ready to help me make people happier, I'm in. If they're not, I'm not. That's really where I stand. All right. Well, um, I have always appreciate the big tent approach. It's how I try to handle yeah. things too, best as I can. Um, yeah, I'm a libertarian socialist. I share your opinion. Uh, freedom is really a means to an end, which is well-being. And uh, freedom is, well, freedom means a lot of different things to different people. I think that one of the biggest issues that I have with this discussion with people broadly is an unwillingness to reconcile the difference between positive and negative freedoms. So many libertarians, or I guess traditional libertarians, as I understand them, are um, very, very interested in the reduction of um or, or a, a, a re negative freedom essentially yeah. the um to remove as many constraints on one's behavior as possible but sometimes yes. constraints i think actually improve a person's freedom for example making it illegal to murder it may prevent us from doing a thing we were otherwise able to do but it also gives society in general people the freedom to live their lives without fear of being murdered or at least with a significantly reduced fear I think that in many cases, many of the things that libertarians take issue with, like say, for example, taxes, actually improve mm -hmm. human freedom because they're a system by which we can lay infrastructure that allows us to better realize our goals. And to me, that idea, that I guess that methodology, translates perfectly onto the fundamental tenets of socialism. The idea that workplaces are probably both better managed and more ethically organized if they're run by the people who work there, collectively owned by the people who work there. I consider it as natural an extension of our beliefs on democracy as, you know, a person living back in the feudal times would have. Why should I be forced to live under a kingdom that is undemocratic? Uh, why then should people be forced to work at institutions which are undemocratic? It seems like a one-to-one -one translation to me. And I think it gives people more- But I, I think there's the, the issue that I have there is, um, there's a couple things. Mm -hmm. One of them is, while taxation, I get what you're saying, you absolutely could build infrastructure with taxation. But there are other ways to build infrastructure also, right? And right. the idea of taxation, while it's working now, there are other ways. And one of the policies I brought up when I was running for office was the idea of paying for New York City infrastructure, which, by the way, is, is billions upon billions of dollars and almost always goes in the red. It's a monopoly. Um, people don't like it, always complain, prices go up. Mm -hmm. Tolls in New York City across the bridge is about $18 already, and we're just gonna raise prices. So I said, you know what? Why don't we take those bridges that right now are named after, you know, usually dead people, and sometimes alive, but usually dead, and instead offer the idea of letting Pepsi have a bridge, and not owning it, but just leasing out the naming rights to it. So the, we still own the bridge, we still cover the maintenance, the maintenance is still there, and so instead now Pepsi can put their name on the bridge and they'll pay us $100 million a year for that bridge, in the, for, the, for the naming rights in that bridge. They're still responsible for the maintenance, so they didn't have to still keep the maintenance. We still inspect the bridge, so it still stays as safe as it would now, in fact, safer, because right now in New York State, bridges actually collapse. But in this case, they wouldn't, because once the bridge got to a certain level that we were afraid, we removed, we were actually remove the, uh, the contract from Pepsi and give it to somebody else, so they repair the bridge. Now you do that with 12 or 14 or 16 bridges within New York State, New York City, all of a sudden now we're, we're paying for the infrastructure, we're, we're getting rid of tolls, which crushes small business owners who own operators. It, the poor people are people who actually come into the city, the wealthy people already live in the city, so the, the working poor are the ones who have to come in. So their actual service is better, we've lowered taxation, and we've come up with an answer that can still fund infrastructure. Right. This is the types of things that I that I bring up constantly. I'll go one more. New York City has a has the largest metro, the largest subway system in the country. And it is, of course, also always underwater financially. So why don't we at night instead allow those those subway systems to be used every other train, which is shut down anyway because of normal traffic, and make it freight trains? So we allow freight to come in from outside the city into the city. And we allow whatever large organization wants to do with uh, Amazon or FedEx or whatever. And all of a sudden now those start coming in. They will have to rebuild the infrastructure to make the larger tunnels and all those things. All those things, they have it. They would love to have hubs, less truck uh, work, I'm sorry, less trucks into the city, 
which means less wear and tear on infrastructure, less danger for individual pedestrians, no more 18 wheelers coming into New York City. And again, they pay for it, which means now we can have a, a metro system that is at least the same, if not cheaper, and higher quality. And I think all that happens without even one extra tax. I think it can be done if we look at it the right way. Yeah, um, I guess I would take issue with these approaches for a few reasons. So I, I'm not to speak on how effectively the government is managing infrastructure in New York City. I've never been mm -hmm. there. I've heard from people who live there that it's uh, it, it, charitably a mixed bag. Charitably. Um, <laughs> that is charitable, yes. Yeah. And there are a number of reasons for that. I imagine that part of it has to do with um, the way our contracting system works, and part of it has to do mm -hmm. with the amount of money allotted and politicians' priorities and who votes for what, and et cetera, et cetera. But I'm sure. a little low than the idea of government selling ad space. If we were to say, for example, need a hundred million dollars to maintain a bridge or to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. rebuild or what have you, I would rather just the government tax Coca-Cola for a hundred million dollars and then just rebuild it with that money. I think that generally speaking, our cities are choked enough with uh, corporate messaging. I'd be loath, I think, to introduce more of it to them, especially since I feel like down the line that could establish a very uncomfortable precedent where we privatize key parts of infrastructure. And at that point, we no longer have a single agency to hold accountable. Like a Hold government. on, there are two things that I want to bring up here on this. The first one is we're not privatizing anything. Right. The ownership. I'm a business guy. The ownership stays with the organization. So the city or the state still owns the actual property. We're only leasing out naming rights. That's all we're doing. We are not giving the bridge away at all. We retain it. So they can't decide to we're going to raise taxes or we're going to make a toll or we're going to shut it down. That does not happen at all. So we still own it. So that's that's a key distinction to make sure we're clear. There's no privatization in this plan whatsoever. We well, still retain the be, asset. That would certainly be preferable. I'm not sure if just advertisement rights alone would ever be enough, even for a company as large as Coca-Cola, to meaningfully pay for the expenses associated with a large bridge, though. I feel like there would have to be some other concession. Or if the ad space was sold, they would only be paying for a, a fraction of a fraction of its cost. Whereas increasing taxes on Coca-Cola, in addition to making me very happy personally, um, would also potentially cover that, that windfall quite a bit. With the freight trains using the metro lines thing, um, I know mm -hmm. that getting infrastructure built and expanded in New York City is difficult because that city is yes. about as choked as you can get. I don't know yep. logistically how effective it would be to allow freight trains to use metro lines. I don't know. I, I guess it's possible. It's I mean, not, I which means they have to rebuild it. That's the point. You're right. It's not. You are correct. It is not logistic. It's not feasible right now at all. They would have to rebuild it, which would give us an entirely rebuilt system. That's the point. You're totally correct. You can't just take freight trains and put them on the subway lines. That's true. So we'd have to rebuild the entire thing. And that's the way of rebuilding the system without having to tax people. That's the whole point, right? I'm, well, who I'm would with pay you for on that, that. They would. That's it. like when you're doing a commercial build out, right? If I want to, you know, if I want to rent out three, three, um, I want to rent out, you know, three, um, you know, three floors on a commercial building in New York City because I want to put bring my company there. Okay. Well, they give me six months to a year to build it out. They don't charge me rent for that time, but I build it out. I spend it and I don't, you know, give me six months rent. I spend it. Boom. Now I start paying rent on the building once I built it out. Same thing here. Now, why do you do that? Because it encourages the people to build it quickly because they got to stop paying rent on it without using it. So it encourages a quick growth and quick building so that they can go ahead and use it. You might go, well, Larry, you know, they'll, they'll make it shoddy. If they make it shoddy, their own trains are trashed. So they're not going to make it shoddy because it will hurt them. So they'll it, obviously make it well enough for their own trains to get by. It just and seems like that would be an trains, enormous upfront investment, though, right? I mean, they it could be. go build in Houston or Austin or in, in Nashville or a city that's 100%. not as densely choked. I don't know if any corporation would ever be able to front that cost. I mean, back during the... Um, Back yeah. during the late 1800s and early 1900s, I know that America was trying to expand its electrical infrastructure westward, you know, connecting yeah. the power lines and what have you, because the West didn't have it and the East did. And initially, corporations were the ones supposed to do that because they ran the power lines, but they weren't doing it because even the relatively meager cost of expanding that infrastructure westward wasn't worthwhile, even if it could mean connecting millions of new people to power lines that they could then charge. The government had to force them to do it. So if corporations are too short-sighted to engage in the investments necessary to connect electorally the states, I'm not entirely sure if they would be willing to invest however millions it would take to chip in for a, a, a an infrastructural billions. upgrade. 
Yeah, it would take billions. I mean, it would take billions. It would literally take billions. But these are companies I'm talking about that are literally dropping billions of dollars with a B, billions of dollars in marketing every year already. For three companies, say, for example, FedEx, I'm making these up. I, I don't have the right. details of this, but say FedEx and um, Amazon and Google, as an example, to each chip in a billion dollars. They would easily do it if if they believe they could keep the leasing rights well, that's on it marketing for that about they, 10 they, years. They get money for it. I mean, they spend billions on marketing because it pays back in the products and services other people purchase. But the Correct. ability to physically – billions spent on a piece of infrastructure they don't own – just so they can get better access to one part of one city. I don't know if the that scales as well. I don't know if that would be as good of an investment on their part. Oh, does it scale outside of New York City? Not as well, I agree. New York City is a 16 million metro person area. I mean, New York City, the metro area of New York City has more people in it than most countries, right? New York City has more people in it than about 40 states. So yeah, uh, for New York City, it works well. That, that was my plan, it was specifically for New York City. You're right, in smaller cities, it probably wouldn't work, but would you wanna have access to 16 million you know, people? Would you wanna have access to a city where prior to COVID, literally four million people used the, the MTA system? Yeah, you would. And not just that, would you wanna have access to a system that gets mentioned on, news, on newspapers and radio and TV, multiple times a day during rush hour? Yeah, you would. And the only reason why I know this is when I spoke about it, I already had bankers asking me about financing. That already came to me. The Wall Streeters already came to me asking about financing, about the bridges, not about the MTA, but the bridges. They were already asking about it. So I know there was interest. And the point is, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you couldn't get $3 billion to do this. Maybe I'm wrong. But it's still the idea that I don't want to say, let me task Coca-Cola. And there's some reason why I don't want to do that. The first reason is if I task Coca-Cola for the bridge, the money won't go to the bridge because it never does. It just doesn't. The money will go into general fund and it will be a disaster. And New York State is, a hor is horrible with money. New York State, and I often compare New York State to Florida because they're very similar in demographics. Not 100%, it's not a perfect analogy, obviously, a comparison, but we have about the same population, about the same white population, um, about the same urban uh, density density and urbanization, about the same. We're very close in those two things, or those several things. So Florida has no, in no income tax, about a $98 billion budget. New York State has less people, and it's a $208 billion budget. New York State's budget, only 20 countries and California are bigger than New York State's budget. And still we have hundreds of thousands of people leaving our state in droves every single year because they're unhappy. So we can't keep our citizens happy with $208 billion. The last thing I'm gonna do is say, hey, Coke, if you wanna stay in my city, my, my, my state, you gotta give me $3 billion or $100 million, whatever the number is, so I can rebuild the bridge and not put your name on it. I would basically be saying, I'm punishing Coke for being in New York. They would leave. That's how it works. That's why other cities and other, that's why other uh, companies have left my state because when they feel attacked, they pack up and they leave. The New York State Stock Exchange is considering leaving. Yeah, I mean, it's got New York in it and it's considering leaving. Well, the, I mean, I feel like a lot of what the New York Stock Exchange does this time can be handled pretty well through like internet infrastructure. So it's possible it's just not worth keeping the physical building. But with regards to infrastructure, the issue that I have with this approach is mostly that it feels like we have a tried and true solution to these issues. America has oh. uniquely bad infrastructure. I mean, for the enormous wealth yeah. this country produces, our infrastructure is bad. But individual cities sometimes excel beyond that limitation. Detroit, for mm -hmm. example, in the past decade has implemented a ton of measures to introduce walkability and to make the city more livable. This has led to increases in bike paths, general infrastructure, public transportation, road quality, and it's been spectacular in the past decade. And this was, of course, a public initiative. In Europe or in parts of Southeast Asia, like say Singapore or Tokyo, where I've ridden on their spectacular subway system, these systems are all government controlled. The decommodification of these systems, both built, maintained, and operated uh, at, the, at the lowest possible expense to the consumer, seem to be the best ones in the world. There isn't a place in the world where a highly privatized system achieves any of these goals, with its high accessibility to the public, with its um, reliable, you know, um, upkeep. These things seem to be the purview of government infrastructure, and that makes sense. Because infrastructure is one of those things that doesn't really have an immediate rate of return. Corporations tend to be in interested in rates of return that are, you know, on mm -hmm. a short enough term that the CEOs can get bonuses 
for the uh, you know for the the stock prices that rise up every yep. quarter every year, and they do well at that. Short term, you know, stock hikes are what corporations do well. But when it comes to laying roads that are meant to function and serve people for centuries afterwards, I don't know if that's something they have a very strong proven track record of doing. Now, all those countries, Singapore, Japan, and Detroit, you know, respectively, they all have to tax quite a bit to keep those systems working. But I'm very, very okay with shaving some of the margins off the excessively wealthy corporations in this country if it means that the millions beneath them can enjoy more livable cities. I actually don't mind the, the taxation, the, the idea of taxing larger you know, companies more conceptually. And let me, let me cover two parts. Um, I totally get what you're talking about in Tokyo. I lived in Japan for, for many years. Nice. Um, and I lived in Asia for a while also, just uh, to spend the time in China, Philippines. So I totally get it. I've been, I've been in Roppongi. I've been in the Tokyo area. This is years ago, though. So I'm sure it's different now. Last time I was in Japan, it was the 90s. So probably 97, 98, give or take in that area. So it was many years ago when I was in Japan. But even then, the government, in, in, in the case talking now, the government can still run the damn thing. Uh, you're, you're acting like I want them to run it. The government can still run it. We still have control and vote. I'm just saying how we fund it. Oh. That's the difference. I just don't want to start funding. I don't trust the government to tax the wealthy. They don't. They do it poorly every single time, and the wealthy always find a way around it. Look, I, I've been an office in a public company twice. And what I know in both cases is we go out of our way to avoid tax. Out of our way. There is literally a tax avoidance industry in America. So you can throw whatever tax you want on whatever company you want. Remember something. Tax law in what will happen. Tax law will always be written by lobbyists. It won't be written by anybody except lobbyists. And the lobbyists will always write tax law so that the big companies will find a way to pay them to get out of it. And that's what happens constantly. We I don't believe that any tax – say again? We can fix these tax laws. I mean, one of the biggest I agree. ones is the fact if that we capital simplify the tax code, I'd be okay with that. If you just said, let's simplify it, everybody pays or every company pays X percent, no matter what, that would be a fairer tax code. I would be okay with that that piece. But trying to get like Coca Cola to say, pay for my bridge seems wrong to me. It's not like corporations don't have corruption either, or that corporations don't mm -hmm. engage in inefficient spending. I mean, we know they do. The yeah. uh, greatest form of wealth in America, by far, is wage theft, or sorry, not wealth, uh, theft. The greatest form is wage theft. It exceeds any other type of theft. Burglary, robbery, all of it pales in comparison to money that is stolen from people through unpaid overtime or through being paid under the table or what have you. Um, so we like corporations have a proven tax record of engaging in, let's say, inefficient behavior in these respects sure. as well. I don't know if the problems with like the government organization of wealth are things we can't fix if we don't want to. Um, because there are other countries that have solved these problems, or at least they don't deal with them to the same extent. We should focus on fixing our tax code. We should focus on rolling capital Agreed. gains tax up, like Biden proposed, 39.4% instead of 20%, so that people can actually get taxed on the money they make off the stock market and other such things. I think that if we fix these loopholes, and if we you know, empower the regulatory agencies that are supposed to overlook these, um, uh, these systems of taxation and government spending, we should be able to manage this more efficiently than any private organization. Well, it, I think in theory that sounds great, but the problem is the people who are actually watching the large organizations, they're just a Praetorian guard for the elite. They're ensuring that everything goes well. The, the SEC, I'll go as far as to say something that, that may sound radical. The SEC doesn't help anybody except large corporations. Um, that's all it does. I mean, the reality of it is the idea that we think government can can watch government, it, it doesn't work. Government can even watch corporations. They're in bed most of the time. The, the only way you could do it is by making a simple system to where anyone could look at it and see that it's wrong. So if the, sim the system is simple, like I'm making this up for sake of argument, you know, ev every corporation pays 15%. I don't care where the money comes from. I don't care where the money goes to. Simple. Anyone can look at the, at the numbers and go, oh, there we go. They made X million times 0.15, they didn't pay that, they're cheating. That style is good. I want us to have much more of a, I often make the comparison between Uno and Dungeons and Dragons. A buddy of mine years ago brought this up. Um, he said, uh, his name is Alex Merced, he ran for Senate in like 2016 or something. But he said he wanted government to be more, a tax to be more like Uno compared to Dungeons and Dragons. 
and everything, regulations, everything would be more like Uno than Dungeons and Dragons. Meaning that if I have a, a, a pack of Uno uh, cards and I walk into a bar or a club or wherever I am and I say, hey guys, you want to play some Uno? I could probably get a couple guys or gals to decide to play some Uno with. They know how to play it. You can play. You don't need a referee. And if they don't know how to play, I could teach them in a couple of minutes and we could play a game if we wanted to. But if I walk in with a bunch of my Dungeons and Dragons books and say, hey guys, who wants the Dungeons and Dragons? Most people are going to say, what's wrong with you? No, what's that? I might get someone to play maybe. If I do, I got to explain the rules. It's over an hour to explain the rules. And the best part about Uno is no need for referee. No need for referee at all. We look, it's a red two. You don't put down a two or a red, you're cheating. We all know. Dungeons and Dragons, everybody's hiding, right? Problem Our that current I have... system and everything we do is Dungeons and Dragons, and it should be Uno. The problem that I have with this analogy is I feel like you're the one who's advocating for a greater degree of complexity. I'm advocating we tax these corporations, then we use their money, uh, which is a fairly straightened by the books process. It's mostly, ju mostly just about ensuring that money goes to where it's needed. Whereas you're advocating for the government to essentially sign advertisement deals with corporations. And that is an avenue which I think has a greater degree of potential for corruption. You could have corporations um, saying that, you know, uh, they're offered a hundred million to put a ad up on a bridge, but then like, hey, hey, mayor, you know, we're the biggest game in town. You want us to leave? Give it to us for five million. And then it turns out the bridge never gets properly funded because the estimates for how much that advertisement space was worth end up getting shortcut by some dirty dealing behind the scenes. I think that your system actually leads to a greater amount of potential nefarious activity between these institutions, whereas... While the tax system is admittedly complicated, at the end of the day, you crank those numbers up, you get that money, and then after that, public spending is mostly a transparent process. It's not perfect. We can improve on that. But we can tell when money is being misallocated, and we can see when uh, construction delays are running excessively. It's, I feel like that process leads to more transparency. I just don't want to be in a city where, like, not only do I have to, you know, every single day I, I, I drive across the bridge, you know, I have to see, like, the big Amazon smiley face. But then later it turns out that, like, every other dealing Amazon has ever done with the cities they moved to, it turns out they shortchanged us and the city's going to have to raise taxes anyway to, you know, to, to cover the balance. But then I still have to look at the damn smile. I just, I don't know. I feel like, uh, I feel like we could just... I, look, I hear what you're saying completely. I feel that the reverse is true. And the reason why, I think if you look historically, every time governments have said, we're gonna raise a tax to do a thing, that always fails. That's 100% failure. That's not true. But if you, look at, if you look at organizations making deals with each other, right? Marketing deals and such, those fail too. And those are corrupt too. But to nowhere near the amount, I mean, again, I, I look at New York State because that's the state I know best. I assume other states are similar. I may be wrong in that. But look at New York State, and I can't think of one time the government said, we're going to raise money, you know, specifically this taxes for this one thing, to where after a couple of years, it just went into the general fund and we didn't know where it was going. And every time that there were overruns, yes, we saw it, and we got angry, and we had no recourse. Because with our left-right paradigm, we still vote for Democrats in New York State no matter what. It doesn't matter where 70% Democrats are relevant. And if you're upstate in most counties, it's Republican no matter what. You get the same Republican no matter what or the same Democrat no matter what. what about so there actually security? is no recourse when we do see the overruns. But if Amazon is bad, as you say, and you go Am and Amazon tries to screw us over or it doesn't pay or whatever the case may be, awesome. Coke is in the wings. Kellogg is in the wings. Pfizer is in the wings. Get rid of Amazon. Put Pfizer in. We actually have some recourse. And that's the point I think. I think mine is a simpler. We've been doing leasing deal, name, le lease, leasing deals for centuries. I mean, it's on football stadiums. They have $20 million for the name on a football stadium that's used on the weekends. I'm talking about a bridge that is used every single day, crossed by a million people in a 16-person metro area, mentioned on every radio station in the area during traffic. You can have people knocking on the door. There's no such thing as only game in town. The only game in town is the bridge. That's the only game in town. So, wait, I strongly take issue with your assertion that tax raises don't lead to um, measurable increases in the quality of life for Americans. The easiest... That's not what I said. No, 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 no. That's not what I said. What I said was for the specific thing. That's what I said. So in other words, if you're telling me I'm going to you know, spend money to fix the bridge, 
Well, that sure, might but work for the first year. But after that, it's just going in a general fund. You would never pay, pass a tax bill just for a single bridge, but you could do it for infrastructure. Like Biden's planning on a, a $3 trillion sure. infrastructure plan. Like, for example, I mean, the Social Security has cut, like, elderly poverty down to uh, half or a quarter of what it used to be. The Revenue Act of 1935 passed by Delano Roosevelt, uh, the wealth tax that he implemented on the, um, the, the essentially the 1% back in those days, um, was necessary in funding the social service programs that ended up catapulting us out of the Great Depression and into the economic boom in the 1950s. I think that taxes, if well used, can be incredibly effective, and a general infrastructure bill would probably have a huge stipend cut out specifically for New York City, what with it being the, the biggest city in America. I think, I mean, the I think the idea that adding like corporate influence into the mix increases transparency or increases our ability to see what's going on is is patently untrue. The uh, methods by which we can investigate wrongdoing on the part of the government are not only better developed, they're also much more accessible to the average citizen than the methods by which we could do so with a corporation, which are nil. With governments, we can um, we can uh, throw out FOIA requests. Uh, we can actually like petition. Have you ever done FOIA requests? It takes a long time, I know, but we can go to town yeah. halls. You can write and letters. And sometimes to your... they just ignore you, and you have no recourse. You can write letters to your uh, mayor or your governor. If a corporation does something bad, you can do nothing. The only thing you can do, if you can find evidence of criminal wrongdoing, is bring that the attention of a DA to it, or sue them if you've in some way been wrong yeah. yourself. But apart from that, yes. Yes, but literally, wait, wait. you can put them in prison. Wait, the misappropriation. You can literally put them in prison. The, the misappropriation of wealth on the part of a business during an ad deal with a government is not something that an average citizen would have recourse for suing. You, you wouldn't be. It would be like uh, in the 2020 election when uh, when Texas filed a lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court only to get dismissed about Pennsylvania's uh, filing process. They don't have standing. No random citizen would have the ability to sue a corporation. This investigation would have to be done by a government agency, whereas if the misappropriation was being done by the state, average citizens would have recourse. I think you're, you're obfuscating transparency. You're reducing the extent to which the average citizen could get involved in this process. I'm, I'm not even saying that what I'm saying is recourse, right? I know you're saying you can do a FOIA request. I, I get it. I know. You know, I... I as a libertarian, I am often having to do FOIA requests, and people around me and my team are often doing FOIA requests. And we are stopped at, at every single time. They ignore us constantly, and we have no recourse. We try to vote people out. It doesn't work in a two-party system where no one cares about a third party, where it's only my guy or your guy, and we're voting against somebody. There is no actual recourse here. Now, is there is there perfect recourse for the corporation? Of course not. But is there some? Yes, what would there it be? is some. What could you do? You you could get any hungry DA who wants to make his name to actually go after a corporation, which we see all the time, specifically Southern District, New York. We're always the ones going after people. We put everybody in jail to the best of our ability. You need criminal one. evidence, but how do, you request, uh, how do you request evidence of criminal activity? How would, what would you give the DA? I don't have to give the DA anything. I've just got to let hit the DA know that there's a story here. And then they do the requests. They're not when journalists. When the DA says, I want information, they get information. When Larry Sharp puts in a FOIA, they go to hell with this guy, see you in court. That's one. And the second thing is, you literally, we are the most litigious society on the planet. You get some lawyer who wants to sue. They literally drop millions upon millions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars, on gathering data so they can hammer the state. There's literally a, there's, there's an industry of people who their entire job is to sue people so they can get insurance money. Those guys who pick this up in a, five a seconds. A district attorney will absolutely not begin a discovery process and put their neck out, start filing papers on a corporation in their town. So for, wait, first of all, if there was rumor of misappropriation of funds from a corporation, the DA can't just start discovery out of nowhere. There has to be some initiative. There has, Something has to sure. take place. Either levying a charge, which would draw an enormous amount of media attention and would probably draw yeah. ire on the relationship between the mayor and the corporation being char filed yeah. against, with no evidence and with no discoverability process on the part of average citizens. Uh, to me, this is fantastical. The, the with with a government, it's not a perfect system. We have some way average citizens can yep. get involved. The only person who could get involved in this corporate environment is a whistleblower or somebody who works for the state who would have recourse. But those are the yeah. only two groups. I would even buy that. I'd even buy that. But again, let's say you're a whistleblower against the government. What happens to you? You go to Russia or you go to jail. Well, that but if you're a whistleblower against the company, you actually have a chance of making if, – if you're going to say my system isn't perfect, you're right. 
I'm just saying my system is better than what we have now. We don't need There's a whistleblower no against the recourse. government. There's no government recourse. There's you don't none. need a whistleblower against the government because there are systems of transparency. Which, which give us what? Which, which give Tell us me more how many than people what, are wait. happy with what's happening in New York City, what's happening in New York State, what's happening in California. We're we, getting our ass kicked. People are unhappy. We want to vote people out. We can't. Now we have people who are just walking away from both parties and not even caring anymore or only voting against the other. I hate Trump or I hate socialism, so I vote because of that. That's, no, I how, recognize that's the, how we're going to make change? I recognize the two-party system is a problem. I'm not denying that. The issue that I have is that there is objectively a greater level of transparency in government uh, uh, financial expenditures than you would have with a private one. You can't FOIA request a corporation. There's less transparency with how they spend their money. Public uh, uh, infrastructure spending is, a, is it's public. Private infrastructure spending, the way they would spend their money, the deals they mm -hmm. take part in, we do not yep. have the same ways of engaging with that. Additionally, and this is just my personal opinion, I think the district attorneys would be way, way, way more willing to bring charges against um, misappropriation of funds within their own city than they would be against corporations who could potentially move and cost the city billions of dollars. It's way better to pin stuff like this on a random city manager than it is to pin something like this in a corporation that has the ability to screw the city afterwards. I think the involvement of corporations just makes this way messier. It's much better to keep this within the state. You know? Well, then I, what I would ask you, if you, if you think that corporations are a bad idea, okay, I'll buy that. They're, they're a bad idea. Then how do we fix this without just basically put a gun to Col Cola's head and say, give me $100 million to fix this bridge or to fix infrastructure, insert thing here. And then Col Cola's saying, you know what? I'm going to move to Houston or Dallas, and I'm not going to pay your taxes, New York State. New York State right now is give or take about a $30 billion deficit with more companies leaving. We lost a million workers last year because of government shutdowns, and about a half a million will probably come back by September. 400 million, we don't know. I'm sorry, 40 million, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, we lost a million. Uh, 500,000 will come back by September, probably. 400,000, we don't know. 100,000 will never return. That's over, it's done. And they're not gonna get better. And now what we're saying is we're gonna tax the rich. That's our, that's our plan in New York State. There's no, no, no growth plan. It's just tax the wealthy. Yeah, That's our current tax, plan. So they can't run. And then the federal government is going to hand it out and decide that New York City gets more money than Arkansas or yeah. whatever? Yeah, states get money from the federal government. I think that um, New York City generally pays out way more to the federal government because of its enormous wealth. It does. But yeah, I think that as part of a general infrastructure plan, yeah, more federal taxes means that uh, more federal money can be spent on infrastructure bills. And then the state of New York City could get some of that and they could choose how to allocate it. And I imagine that if there's a bridge that millions of people use, then they would probably have that one pretty first up for, you know. You would think, way. but we've had a, a tunnel between New Jersey and New York literally for decades is the one tunnel we have that is the corridor tunnel where all the trains go through. It's one tunnel, it's old as hell, should've been repaired, and we can't get it repaired. Now, all we had to do to be forward with you is go, hey, um, let's make that the Amazon Prime tunnel. That's fixed in five years. Done. I just I don't know it's if that would. Years. I don't know if that would happen. I genuinely don't. But I know what does work, which is it's not what we have tax now. Tax and spend. Well, no, tax not what we have now. Tax and spend hasn't worked. Wait, no, tax and spend does work. That's been the the system of every great piece of infrastructure the planet around. I don't know if selling ad space is the way to fix infrastructural problems. I know that my system works because it's worked in other countries. The problem please, that we have is that we don't tax enough. Our country. We tax nothing. We tax like babies. We tax a fraction of what we should our be taxing. Our budget, the New York's, I'm sorry, the, the American budget is what, three or four trillion dollars now? You tell me we don't tax? How do we get that money? Well, I mean, you've seen how our of federal tax, tax rate, you, you've seen how our federal tax rate has fallen over time. Sure. Yeah, so we could tax way more. We have more wealth than ever before. What's the GDP of America these days? Isn't it like fourteen trillion? I mean, it's some insane number. It's very high. Twenty-one uh, trillion. We are. Yeah. yeah, China is fourteen. We're twenty-one point four three. Yes. We could be. We could be wringing them dry. The uh, the so, wealth. Okay. The wealth so, of the so, the top one percent over the past couple of years alone has skyrocketed. Wealth is being consolidated further and further into the hands of a group of people who nobody wants to tax for some reason. Why not? This is true. No, no, this is absolutely true. L let me let me go there because I, I guess you're I'm not against raising more money. I'm just saying why tax? That's what I'm saying. I'm not against raise. How about instead of raising taxes, we increase commerce? How about instead of raising taxes, 
we get corporations to pay for things they want to pay for so they won't run. Right, that's my point. I'm trying to make this a voluntary pay system for with their taxes. so that people will pay what they want to pay for. I would just rather have a single system where we take all the tax dollars and then we distribute it as needed than a thousand individual petty deals between mayors and businesses that are virtually opaque, impossible to actually engage in any transparency that may or may not lead to like the paying of individual. I just think it's way simpler to keep all of this under a tax base. And it could potentially be cheaper for everyone down the line too because the economy of scale ensures that being able to access an infinite wealth pool as we essentially do with the federal government because we print our own money, uh, means that we, we might be able to address these problems more effectively than we could if we just, you know, tried to deal with it with a, with a million band-aids. These corporations will stay in the country if we tax them higher. They'll do it. And we'll, not just business taxes, too. Personal taxes, wealth taxes, state taxes. We could be wringing hundreds of billions more out of these people every single year. And we could pay for that bridge. We could pay for but everything here's my, to. But here is my point in what you're saying. You're telling me that it works. I haven't seen it work in my lifetime. So maybe it works. I haven't seen it work, and I'm in my 50s, and I haven't seen it work in my lifetime. So if, it's, if it used to work, maybe it used to work. But what I've seen us throw taxes at is things like the Vietnam War, bombing people in, in the Middle East, unnecessary drug wars. I've seen us doing that. Like I've said, we, we literally build more tanks and we have 3,000 tanks sitting in Arizona right now that we can't even use, and we haven't fought a tank war in, I don't know, 50 years, 70 years. That's where it actually goes. Tax and spend means tax and waste. That's what it actually means. I get, in theory, yeah, if we had lots of money, we'd do stuff. I give you the New York State example. New York State has less people than Florida. Double the budget. Yet we are worse off by any measure. Well, true, Education, but they also produce employment, more. just loss of small businesses. I mean, any way you want to, we, we spend $28,000 per kid per year in New York State, and at best we rank 25th, depending on how you rank the states, and at worst we rank 37th. Well, I think Lots a lot of, of that has to do with the way- the problem. Well, a lot of that is because New York City has been historically a um, full of immigrant ghettos that have much poorer socioeconomic outcomes. Um, <laughs> you know, the, wor the worst no. school districts in, in, the, in the country are actually in Rochester, New York. Rochester, New York, if you are a black youth, in Rochester, New York, male specifically, you have a less than 20% chance of graduating high school. Yeah, but there are socioeconomic reasons for that beyond just like tax expenditures. Of course! Look, if your belief is that the reason why taxing is not something you're super in favor of, if that's because we spend so much of it on military action, then I am 100% on board. Because I'll tell you this much, here's where my priorities are at, okay? I would rather raise 400 trillion a year by, or sorry, 400, 400 billion a year by uh, <laughs> not waging war around the world than I would by raising taxes. That would be my immediate priority. I'm just, since we're talking about taxes, we're talking about taxes. Obviously, we spend far too much in our military. Obviously, we spend far too much maintaining hundreds of military bases around the world. I know that any libertarian would agree on that point. But to me, I mean, this, like, at that point, it becomes more of a pragmatic, we need to, you know, do something about the military industrial complex kind of deal. We would be able to redistribute an enormous amount of wealth around this country if we could address that. Agreed, but the wealth gap piece is far more based upon how the it, the wealth gap. While there are many reasons why this, the wealth gap is increasing, mm -hmm. I still believe the number one reason why the wealth gap is increasing is because of all these crashes we have, heavily based upon the Fed, heavily based upon um, our stock market, heavily based upon those issues that no, had nothing to do with the individual person and whatever tax rate you have. I mean, when you have a system where Literally once, and we saw this with COVID, right? Everybody knew there was going to be a crash when COVID hit us. And that's why those couple of senators sold their stocks ahead of time, right? This yeah. is a common thing, right? Once, once the crash is coming, the elites already know. They tell their, this thing is called, by, by the way, some of you may not know this. This thing is, this is called burning your books. And for the sake of argument, you have a financial advisor who is a high-end financial advisor. He's got 100 clients for the sake of argument. 10% of those clients are his top clients. Each of them has $10 million or more under assets. All the rest have less than two million. He doesn't really care much about them. The crash is coming. He knows this. Bosses tell him. He tells those ten people, "Hey, the crash is coming. Let's get liquid so you're ready. Let's do that." So they get they they you know get liquid. Then when the crash hits, he tells the other ninety, "Hey, sorry, crash is going to hit. It's already hitting now. Start selling your stuff. Start getting liquid whatever you can so you can pay your bills. Who's going to buy it? The ten percent that he told 
right, that the crash is coming. They're liquid and they're ready for it. They buy up assets of the middle class, and they usually do it through machines like private equity, hedge funds, things like that, other other shell companies, and they buy up a bunch of properties, and they buy up a bunch of homes, they buy up a bunch of cars, and they buy up businesses, well, this is a and they buy everything problem, up, and they take no? up all the wealth. Well, this is, a, this is a capitalism problem, no? I mean... Yes, nothing to do with taxation. Well, no, but I mean, the reason why we have this issue of cyclical economic crashes is in large part because of our system, in, our system of investment allows for people with a lot of economic power and autonomy to influence the system in ways that sometimes pays off with an enormous short-term benefit and sometimes yep. doesn't. But that has to do yep. with our system. Of, I, don't, I don't think that's like a, I don't think that's a problem with the, with the Fed or, or with taxes or anything. I think that would be an argument for decommodification. The fewer industries are caught up in commodification, the fewer... I mean, for God's sake, I'm a big fan of housing decommodification. 2008 was because of the housing market. If it weren't for the meddling of private entrepreneurs in that field, then we wouldn't have had that crash. It wouldn't have been capable of happening. So that's one of the reasons why I advocate for the things I do. Economic downturns are inevitable to some extent. COVID was always going to influence the economy negatively. It's a global pandemic, for Christ's sake. I mean, there's no getting around that, but... I don't know. I feel like but I thought I you said taxes, and this is why I said it. I thought maybe I misheard you. I thought you were saying, "Well, we can redistribute wealth because the, because of the taxes." That's why we have this wealth gap. That's what I thought you said. Did I mishear you? Oh, well, the wealth. I mean, the consolidation of wealth. You mean between like the uber wealthy and the regular people? Yes, I thought you were saying it was because of taxation. That's what I thought you well, said. Well, that's part of it because I mean, we used to tax them more. If we had a ninety percent wealth tax above a given threshold, then they probably wouldn't be that wealthy, but. A lot of it also has to do with the way capitalist econ or market economies, I should say, necessarily, um, you know, uh, uh, allow their wealth to coagulate. Uh, the way we used to have like 50 banks in America, and now we have like six, yep. the con a consolidation yep. of wealth seems to be an inevitable consequence of these processes. It's why we're supposed to prevent mergers and monopolies to some extent. Yes. But we don't really do that because the government yes. benefits from its collaboration with mega titan industries that are too big to fail. But again, all of this 100%. has to do with the power of capital, no? No, not, not necessarily. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. The consolidation is a terrible idea. We should be breaking up monopolies. I'm all about ending monopolies um, to include government, which is a monopoly, right? I'm, I'm all about ending monopolies. I completely agree. I hate cartels. The biggest reason why we have these problems is because of monopolies and cartels. So let me go back to the, the, the crash issue, and then I'll cover the concept of monopolies and cartels. The crash issue, I believe it's heavily because of the Fed. Because the Fed has basically made money free, so debt is a thing. It makes sense that. I remember when I was a kid, my first job, I was 16 years old or something like that. I forgot what it was. And I went to a bank, and they gave me a gift for me opening up a savings account. I mean, it was an electric can opener. I brought it to my mom. So it, people used to actually want to open up accounts. Now retail banking is a joke. Retail banking is nothing. Why? Because the Fed has made money free. My, my parents, when they got their uh, mortgage, they had a 13% mortgage. That's what happens when the market just runs on its own. You get percentages like that. When the Fed comes and says, money is free, why would you save? It makes no sense. We are a debtor's economy heavily because of the Fed. Not only, obviously, we have cultural issues, of course, but heavily because of the Fed says, why the hell would you save? It makes no sense. Spend it. I was in with bankers before the crash of 2008, and they would look at a company. And a company, the guy would be proud of his company. He'd say, oh, my company's great. We're, we're up to, you know, 20 million, blah, blah, blah. We have no debt. And the bankers would be mad at him. So why do you have no debt? What are you, stupid? You know, you know servicing debt is nothing now. Why don't you have debt in your company? You could grow. You could buy. You could do all these things. And that's because the Fed has made money free. If but the money's free, people are more apt to speculate. They're more apt to go into debt. You just see it every. If the Fed were to stop making the money basically free, that wouldn't happen. Plus, the banks just make money for free anyway because they're banks. But so that's the only reason our economy is as strong as it is. If people are incentivized just to save money, they don't go and spend it in the economy. Low interest rates are the bedrock of economic growth. We see that in China as well. Their GDP has skyrocketed to nearly eight times what it used to be since 2004. And that's been in large part because their, um, their willingness to allow free investment with low interest rates. I mean, it seems to be beneficial in a number of ways. I don't like I understand there are problems with the debtor's economy that I'm critical of, but I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know 
I really don't feel like our economy would be any better if interest rates were higher than they are now. That would screw over a lot of people. Yeah, if it happened overnight, absolutely. But if we had actually retained lower, uh, higher interest rates in general, m less people would go bankrupt. Some would still go bankrupt, but less would because they wouldn't go so far into debt because they couldn't afford to service the debt. So they wouldn't go as far into debt as much. Now, obviously, people will still go bankrupt. Less people would buy homes they couldn't afford. There'd be less speculation in general. So there'd be less of that. Now, of course, people will still go bankrupt, but there'd be less of it. Yes, lower interest rates gets people spending money. That's true. But it's not because money's cheap because the market says it's cheap. Money's cheap because the magical Fed says it's cheap. That's literally changing the market. Well, sure. They There's going the to be a price to pay for that. The poverty rate in the United States has decreased over time, though. I feel sure. like there. I, so it's true that the debtor's economy that we live in has its problems, but I feel like there are yes. ways to compensate for its effects without engaging in behaviors that would tank our GDP. If we engaged in deflationary measures and if we drastically increased uh, interest rates, that would lead to a substantial decrease in our growth, which would lead to a decrease in our taxable income, which would lead to a decrease in the expansion of government programs. I feel like th this could, even if it was done slowly, I feel like that could potentially be very, very devastating. I think the Fed has a right to do whatever the hell they want with the interest rates in these countries. I mean, they make the money. The only reason currency exists is because it's a, a, a commodity, it's a currency that the government produces uh, for its own convenience so it can later tax you back for it. I mean, if they put the money into printing it, then they are the ones ultimately who... We're, we're borrowing it from them, essentially. I don't think that there's like... The concept of money, the US dollar, I don't think it exists outside the will of the Fed. It's something that ultimately they're the one who, um, who wrangles. I'm I'm not sure where you were going with that. Um, let me let me see if you, I can. Do you think that they have a right to control the interest rates in a way which is beneficial to the country? Do they have a right? Yeah, like That's do you a, think it's you good? Mean, like it's good for them to do? That? Oh, is it good? No, 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 it's not good. No, no. Do they legally? Obviously, they can. The government has given them permission to do so, and I think that was a mistake. I'm not a fan of the Fed at all. I think it's a terrible idea. However, do they have a right? Yeah, it's in the con. They, the, they've said you can do it, so go ahead. Why well, should they no, print money a, at all then? Great question. I love that. Yeah, well, that's wait, a good without, question. Wait, wait, but without them printing money, we don't have currency. We need somebody to print no, the, the money. No, the government can print money. I don't mind that. And they, they can print money anywhere. They can back it against something, right? Whatever they want, it's fine. My point is the if you. My point is the Fed is doing what it thinks is right. I think for the next three or four years. And they've now put themselves in a position to where they can never raise the rates again with any real, I mean, like by a half percentage point, maybe. But they can't raise it back up to what it should be. We don't know what the real value of money is anymore, if there is a real value of money. We have no idea. There isn't. Our it's... money is backed by you know guys like me who are prepared to be in the Marine Corps and storm some beach or drone peep pilots who will bomb people or bombers or a nuclear umbrella. The money is backed That's by the strength of the dollars. U.S. government. As long as the Say U.S. Again? government, as long as the U.S. government is considered a reliable, uh, you know, economic power, the, the United States dollar has its power. But at the end of the day, no. the U.S. dollar no. doesn't have Not any true. worth or value outside of its no, ability. You're incorrect. To... No, well, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, that's no. the only. Wait, no. if you wait, if the United States crashed, like like dissolved, the U.S.D. wouldn't have any worth anymore. It would be. It would be. If the, let me tell you what would happen, so you're clear, what, what would happen? If the United States all of a sudden tomorrow defaulted or whatever, insert bad thing here, the United States would then say, oh, we're going to reboot our dollar, and we're going to put a new dollar out, and we're going to say it's worth X. And if the world said, no, we're not, we'd say, well, then we're going to remove our nuclear shield from you. Now, Japan, no nuclear shield. Now, wait, Germany, wait, 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 no whoa, 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 wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's wait, what we wait. would do. Wait, we you can't use the force of our military for them to accept our dollar again. That's what we do now. Wait, we no. do it all over again. So first of all, so you you agreed with my premise there because the original dollar's worth is is worthless there. Then you have to make a new dollar. Correct. But you can't just yes. declare the worth of a dollar. The worth of the dollar is determined by the global marketplace. You can like you couldn't yep. make a dollar and then say this dollar is worth one hundred pounds and that's the new standard. Like you would, it yes, would have to be. Why would any yeah, company ever take that seriously if this Junta America could end up falling in a decade? Who would ever trust that currency? Why would anybody invest no, in you, it? No, you're okay. To be clear, uh, the assumption here is, and, and I make sure our assumption is clear. You're saying that if the if the U.S. you know defaulted or something, 
right? Are you saying that the U.S. went under like as a country? Is that what you're saying? If it dissolved, if there was no longer an American oh, government. Oh, then yes, you're correct. I'm sorry. I think you meant like we just defaulted on our money. I'm sorry. I apologize. If I we defaulted, the you. worth of the U.S. dollar would go down. There's no denying that. Yes, and we would just reboot it and decide what we want, and we would use our military force. That's what America does. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying we should do it. I'm just being forward. There is no doubt that we wouldn't simply use our use our physical presence across the world and say, yeah, we're saying the dollar's worth this, shut up and accept it. Then assuming and some that's people the go case, against us, they would. Then assuming that's the case, then you agree that a value of a dollar is a subjective determination relative yes. to the power of the institution distributing it. Yes, Wait, but, that's but that's my the, point, that the US dollar is only worthwhile because it's backed by the government, that there's no inherent or intrinsic worth or value. It's not a fiat Correct. currency. We're not backing this in Fort Knox anymore. It's just yeah. how much do you trust the US government? Correct. Well, see, there's the issue. No, no, no. Not how much you trust the US government, how much you fear the US government. Well, how much you have to trust the US government. I do there not think I'll that the US okay. would start threatening nuclear Armageddon if we weren't able to get our dollar to- No, 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 we wouldn't to... threaten nuclear Armageddon. We would say we're not gonna protect you against nuclear strike. Why our would any country would ever take America seriously if it defaulted, made a second currency, and then tried to bully the other countries in the world? I just, why can't, the, why can't we just keep interest rates low? I feel like that'd be- <sighs> Easier, I man. would because it's because it's unnatural and false is why and what there's going to be a price what to pay. Mean? What's a natural interest rate? We didn't find these in nature. We invented this. No, I agree. I, it's not natural. When I mean natural, I don't mean like you know the birds and the bees decide what that is. I don't mean that at all. What I mean is like like anything else, right? Is there a, is there a lot of something? Is there a perceived scarcity in something? then is there more value? Is there less perceived scarcity than there's less value in it, right? That that kind of back and forth, consumer driven, that kind of thing. Yeah, That's what can, I mean when I say I natural. I could draw a dollar bill and it's like a Vosh dollar and there's only one of it, sure. but nobody would proportion its worth relative to its rarity. The only reason any of this is worth anything is because it's backed by power. And it, it, since power is what determines X or Y, you just advocated for the U.S. government using military force, essentially. I didn't to, advocate for it. Or sorry, I not advocate. You, you said that it would happen. Yes. To, yes. To determine the worth of some sort of like secondary dollar, or like a backup, a follow-up dollar, 2.0. Sure. Then if that's yeah. the case, I don't know what a natural interest rate is. At the end of the day, all of this is subject to as much control from one side as it is another. A push and pull between Agreed. consumer forces, the Fed, and the state. And I don't know if there's anything wrong no, with that. No, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that, you know, I guess maybe the word natural was, a wrong, was the wrong word. Maybe that was the wrong word. That's how it feels to me when I say that. So I'm, I probably let my emotion pick the wrong word. What I, what I meant was something that is more consumer driven based upon how much money you would naturally want um, to borrow or use or take. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you look back prior to Glass-Steagall, I'll give you this example, right? I'm I'm a big fan of less regulation with the exception of Glass-Steagall. I think Glass-Steagall was a critical piece. It should have never gone away. It's a terrible idea. Why? Because of culture, not because of the actual law, because of culture. And for those people who may be watching who don't know, that law was ended, I believe, by Bill Clinton in 1989. And what that act did was it basically said, you can be one of two types of banks. You can either be a savings and loan or an investment bank. Pick what you want, be the one. What we did is we tried to, and it didn't work, obviously, just continue deregulating that began around Reagan is when it began deregulation, and we just kept deregulating until the 2000s. Enron happens, everything begins to happen. Now it's a re-regulate. And I'm saying don't re-regulate. Just put back Glass-Steagall. And here's the reason why. Most people, when they go to their local savings and loan, believe that their life insurance, that their mortgage, that their savings account is not going to go into the market. They believe that it's a savings and loan. It's like when my mom had a mortgage. They don't realize that all your stuff now is going to go into investment banking. Why? Because of your earlier point, which is it makes sense for banks to go into investment because they make more money. Transaction fees, gambling on the, on the market. It's a great idea. So they take all of our loans. They take all of our stuff and they shove it into the market. They put it into the casino. If you knew that your mortgage was going to a casino, you probably wouldn't get that kind of mortgage. If you knew your life insurance was going to a casino, you probably wouldn't do that. If your retirement was going to a casino, you probably wouldn't do it. You put Glass-Steagall back in, all of a sudden now, savings and loans are only that, which means they make their money on interest. They don't make their money on investments. 
which means by default, interest rates will have to go up because the banks can't make money any other way, which means they'll encourage savings because those savings and loans, that's how they make money. So yeah, once you break class eagle, that is when everything became, everything goes into the market. And so now everything is about investment. Everything's about product. If you went into a, a bank in 1995 and you talked to your, your banker then, that banker would ask you about things, ask you to get a savings account, so-and-so. Now, all they want to do is sell your product. Why? Because that's how you make money. Investments, investments, in investments. So part of the glass deal coming down was people, now every bank is subject to the Fed. Everything is subject to the Fed and keeping it low is good for everybody. Keeping it low wouldn't be good if you had savings and loans. So my point is, I want the average person who doesn't want to put their money into an investment bank to not have to. But now you have almost no choice. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm almost not. No I'm not anti Glass Steagall at all. I'm. I am not. I, not to speak. I wasn't. You know, I was barely alive. You know, back um, when this was even. Um, mm -hmm. when this was even repealed. But I. You know. I, so I'm not concerned with that. I just the, the issue that I have is that it seems like interest rates have been kept low, which has led yep. to a growth in our economy, and poverty yep. is decreasing. So it seems like the main negative externality for keeping the interest rates low has been accommodated for, and we got all the benefits of a more no, robust the, in, the, the poverty rate was going down before 1999, and we were still growing. We grew hugely after wait, World the, War wait, II. Wait, the Fed's have controlled the interest rates. And that was, interest rate. rates weren't, weren't crazy low. Wait, the Fed has controlled the interest rates since before 1999. I know, but the interest rates weren't crazy low back then, is my point. You're saying that they're low now. Yes, they're low now, and they weren't low before, and poverty's been going down for decades, and stuff's been, we've been growing for decades. We've still been growing. It's not like all of a sudden, when the interest rates went down, that we all of a sudden started exploding. We've been exploding for a long time. The biggest increase is not because of interest rates. It's be, it's the low interest rates have not only assisted, have not only assisted in making things worse, they've also assisted in consolidation. Why? Because now because you can go into debt, it's much easier for you to do mergers and acquisitions. Wait, but the government yet again screwed up and decided that we're gonna make all these rules to hurt these rich, big, rich companies. They decided that in 2000 after Enron and said, we're gonna make all these rules. So what did the rich people do? They did two things, number one, they went to Toronto, and the Toronto Exchange exploded because you can go public in Toronto a whole lot cheaper than you can in America. So that was the first thing they did. So they made the Canadians wealthier. Thank you, America, for that, I guess. But the second thing they did is they decided to go into debt and to buy companies. Now, for those of you who may not know this, I don't know how, how savvy your audience is. Uh, sorry, Bosch, I don't know how savvy your audience is. So I'm just going to cover it in case they're not. I don't know who, well, who I just who I, I feel like show. we're acting a little tangential right now because I'm concerned oh, about the me, relationship please. that you're implying here. Um, I'm saying that when when they the companies decided to now raise a bunch of money because they want to raise money, and because interest rates were so low, it became very easy to simply purchase other companies. You buy out other companies, you overvalue them on purpose, so that you can instead of borrowing ten million dollars by a company, you borrow thirty. You give the owner five, so he'll shut up and go away. You take the company. Now you have twenty five million dollars. You then sell all the assets of the company because you didn't want it anyway. So you dump all the assets, keep any IP that you like, keep any talent that you want, fire everybody else, and you put $20 million in your pocket to grow your company and you carry the debt. Servicing the debt is minimal because the interest rate's so low. So you can carry debt like that for the next 10 years and who cares? Okay, that just assists in growing more, more All things. of the externalities that you're describing right now are things yep. that we can accommodate through policy. But the benefits that we've gotten from lower interest rates have been objectively beneficial to the average what living policy? standard of the America. Wait, hold on. So our GDP has increased massively. Lower interest rates means people are more able to um, uh, 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 to invest. People are more sure. able to. The economy has grown. More wealth is coming into yep. the country. And the problem yep. is, the problem is that normally that would lead directly to an increase in the wealth of the average American. We don't yes, have that, but, it but it's not. But it's not because mm -hmm. of low interest rates. It's because we have historically low tax rates with a deliberately obfuscating tax code that we do not work to address. The problem here is not the interest rate. The problem is that we allow corporations to exploit the existing interest rate. If you have a problem 
with corporations engaging in mergers and consolidation and monopolizing and uh, yeah. not paying their fair share, the interest rate is not the target of your antagonism here. The, the target of your antagonism should be pretty clearly a set of political and economic policies that have been invoked over specifically mostly since Reagan with the deliberate intention of allowing these corporations to give away with whatever it is they want. One of the issues that I have is we have such a clear antagonist in this situation. When we're, when we're talking about, say, for example, the repeal of Glass-Steagall, or we're talking mm -hmm. about the 2008 um, financial crisis, or we're talking about all of the economic issues we deal with today, when we're talking about the overconsolidation of wealth, there is a clear and present antagonist. As a socialist, yep. I get to call them the bourgeois, which makes me feel very fancy. But generally speaking, it's the consolidated interests of the wealthy and entrenched economic classes in this country. Their motives are clear. Their influence is clear. But to me, when you start talking about the Fed and you talk about the interest rate only in the negative effects that it has and not in its positives, we obfuscate the issue. And in a way, we play cover for the corporations that are responsible for this sort of policy. And that's the concern that I have. If we want the average American to live a better life, we need to mm -hmm. raise taxes. We need to introduce harsher anti-monopolization laws. We need to bring back uh, Glass-Steagall. There are things we know we need to do. I don't know if antagonism against the Fed really plays into it because the lower interest rates do have other benefits. And we also know, by the way, that if we run our economy to a position where people are more interested in saving and less interested in investing, whatever negative externalities that may have, that means that our country will be overtaken by China faster, which could end up, among other things, leading to the uh, US dollar being less influential in global trade, which would then have severe negative externalities for our market forces and for the average American. So I think it's in everyone's best interest that we find a way to redistribute the wealth that we have, benefiting from those low interest rates without relying on some, some, some I don't know, this, the, the belief that returning to the way things used to be will fix our problems or will fix our inequalities. I, I, I don't want to return to the way things used in, to be. With I regards hope to interest rates, saving and what have you. Oh, that part. Yes, I'm sorry. So in, guilty as charged on that one. Yes, that I want to go back to. I do want to go back to people being able to save normally in a savings and loan to be the normal thing. The American people should not be so much in debt. It's a bad idea. It's just not good for every person to be in debt so much. That's one of the reasons debt? why we collapse so fast. Second, why are they in debt? Because our culture says it's okay to have debt, so we do it. We just go on our credit Wait, card, and we buy more, and fewer, we buy more, and we buy more. Fewer Americans own their houses today than they did yep. 80 years ago. It's not yep. overconsumption that's leading to debt. It's price raises. It's education. It's medical debt. It's housing places inflating because NIMBYs don't want additional housing built in their neighborhoods. This is true. The reason people are indebting themselves isn't because people are being irresponsible with credit cards, or at least that's not all of it. That's definitely a part, but it's not all of it. It's in large part because many of the critical elements of what we consider to be American culture have become obscenely expensive. But that will not mm -hmm. get fixed by raising the inflation rate, or sorry, by raising the uh, interest rate. That'll only make them more inaccessible. We need other systems to address these uh, price imbalances. So I, I guess what you're trying to say is you, you don't you instead of a bottom up answer, you would prefer a top down answer. Top down. I'm is trying the to create a bottom up answer, which means I can still get services that people need without having to tax them by having corporations still pay for those services, as you're saying but they voluntarily buy things that they want versus me trying to tax them. And the reason why I'm so scared of taxing, taxing them is there's several reasons. You, you just said you want to like tell big companies to pay you more so the federal government can pay for the bridge. Yeah, That sounds them. like top the, down to me. No, the government is beholden to my will. I'm a tax paying citizen. I no, it isn't. There's no data to show that's true. Wait, yes, no. there is. Wait do I get to vote no. on what Coca-Cola does? No. Yes. By not buying Coke. Yes. No, no, no. That vote with you your wallet. No, that you doesn't do. wait. wait, that doesn't work. Nobody votes with yeah. their wallets. People buy what's convenient. No. For them. Why do you think that entire thing uh, uh, about diversity training? Why did Coke have diversity training? Because it makes them look good. 
Thank you, because we, as a culture, can affect them. Yes, no, we wait. have more effect on coke than we do our government. Wait, no, 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 no. Wait, hold on. First of all, wait, 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 first of all, government institutions have also had diversity training. For, they've been doing it for longer, by the way. Second know, of all, Coca-Cola cashing in on a trend that uh, Robin D'Angelo has started. Uh, does not mean that they are suddenly beholden to the will of the people. Third of all, that uh, diversity training was not brought about by public backlash or will. It was brought about by a collection of contractors who make their money by convincing CEOs that they'll be less likely to get canceled on Twitter if they can teach their uh, their 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 employees about neo pronouns. But that isn't a yes. bottom up procedure. That isn't us voting with our wallets. That's just standard corporate virtue signaling, wait, and they've been doing minute. it so, for centuries. So you're telling me that being afraid of being canceled on Twitter, as you said, they're more afraid of being canceled on Twitter than being attacked by the government. Wait, no, they're, wait, hold on. Coca-Cola has spent, Coca-Cola has spent millions on lobbying and on preventing taxes from being raised. They That's spent how many thousands on a PowerPoint? No, they're more afraid of the government. Everybody's they more control afraid of the government. The government. No, no, stop. No, this is irresponsible and highly reductive, okay? The idea that the average American citizen has more control over the behavior of a corporation than their government is not true. In addition to the fact that we have systems of transparency for the government that allows us to analyze their behavior and actually directly hold them accountable, we also have, additionally, the fact that they are directly beholden to us. Boycotts don't work. Voting with your wallet doesn't work. There are few examples of effective boycotts in American history, and they're usually localized or in industries where it's possible for there to be a stopgap or a bottleneck, like yeah. the Alabama uh, busing boycotts back during the uh, civil yeah. rights movement. Examples like that function. But when th there has not been an instance, in as far as I can remember, human history, where a corporation has been brought low by unethical behavior without the arm of the state weighing down on them. The state is the only thing that can reign in corporations, nothing else. So that is the only thing we can do. Now, corporations, as they stand today, control an enormous amount of American political and economic you know, society. Yeah. The only way we can rein them in is with strong tax policies in a government that is beholden to the people, which is why, as unfortunate as it is, I think that the existence of a strong state is the only way we can ensure people's freedoms right now. Because the idea that we're going to get corporations to fall into line by buying or not buying their products is just not true. Coca-Cola has funded death squads in Latin America. Nobody cares. These news stories, they, they run through the paper. Nobody pays attention. Nobody cares what they do. Because, because why? What? Because it happens elsewhere. It happens in the, the global south and developing world. It's, it's they export all of the horrible things these corporations do. They bring the wealth home, and that's all people see. This is just, we can't hold them accountable through public willpower. Um, wow. Did, did you just say, so I'm clear, you just said the only way we can, I, I'm going to paraphrase, so if I'm strong wrong, state, please tell yeah. me I'm wrong. With a strong state. Yeah, right now, absolutely. Don't you call yourself libertarian? Don't yeah. you self-identify as that? Yeah, because I care about freedom. And right now the state is the system by which we can ensure our freedom. Yeah. The absence of the state would only allow us to be uh, taken advantage of. I do of not want to get rid of the state. I've not said that. I want to be clear. Some, some libertarians are that route. I was very clear up front. I'm not about abolishing it. I'm not. The reduction of the people... state. The state is pathetically weak right now. What does the state even, what's, what influence does the state even have in our lives? It right literally, now? literally, we, we had to wake up in the morning and look on the news to whether we can go outside and go to our work. And? Tell me what entity is more powerful than that. Well, we literally had to decide whether I can send my kid to school or not. Tell me what entity is po more powerful than that. Not even the church can do that shit. The church There's can close no itself down. The government me. can close its institutions down. And the government also has the right to influence policy with regards the to the opening and closing. The government can shut down water. churches. It yeah. did that. It's not its institutions. Go, yeah, it could. It exists. Yeah, well, it exists on the government's land within the government's property. By existing within the, the United States' doesn't? borders, they exist knowing that they are subject to laws of the United States. I think that the government hey, should I'm have been sorry. much harsher what, with the lockdown. What law? What law? Help me with this. What law says that a state government can decide, you know what, Larry Sharp, you can't go to work today and feed your family. You can't do that. I don't remember a law that said that. And maybe I missed it, but I don't remember that in the Constitution. I don't remember that in New York State law. All I know is our assembly in New York State, and I can only speak for my state, so I, this may not be true in the states. My assembly decided to surrender the rights of what the people want and instead just give our governor magical powers to do whatever he wants, and he did it. The government has and the right to shut down businesses and institutions 
for public health reasons. And that is exactly what they have been doing. They can shut a restaurant down or they can shut a building down if they feel that okay. it's uh, infrastructure. I'm not saying you're unsafe. wrong, but you just well, you said the Well, you asked me what law, so I'm telling you, those are the laws. The government has right. the right to shut down facilities. I love it. So government has the power to do everything. So how can you say the government's weak? You just because, said the government's weak. Because the government's for, the most because powerful for, entity in the, in the planet. Because first of all, we didn't have a federal COVID lockdown. We only had statewide ones, which means there are plenty oh. of states where COVID just ran rampant. The federal government didn't really take anywhere near of a strong enough action. I would have invoked war powers. Second of all, the government does anything nearly enough to rein in the corporations. Corporations are the ones that run rampant. They do most of the damage to our economy. They make most of the money from our economy. And the I government agree. is very concerned with things like, say, for example, in Alabama, whether or not trans kids can get health care. They have power in that respect. But they seem monumentally weak when it comes to challenging the economic interests of corporations. That is where I want them to be I agree strong. With that. No, no, I agree. If, if you're talking about oh, specifically corporations, I'm with you. I mean, they don't because I think they're almost the same. I, I don't see much of a difference. I see the revolving door of corporate lobbyists and 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 you know members of our Congress, members of our Senate. I mean, I see the revolving door. The people who write the laws are corporate lobbyists. Those are the people who are writing the laws. Then they get tweaked here or there by somebody within the office of, you know, some congressman or some senator or congressperson or some senator, and then that gets, you know, put out as a bill. Yeah, but capitalism it's elevates lobbyists. the democratic will of the uh, of the wealthy. Yeah. yeah, agreed. But how can you say it's not powerful? Well, no, it is. But the the power, if if then if we're to be specific, the power is being misused. The power is being directed incorrectly. The American government has the power to do three things exactly. Okay. Kill brown people abroad, tell people Very within our that. own borders that they can't have sex Very with other that. groups of consenting adults, and uh, tell corporations uh, that they are free to make as much money as they want off of the land, resources, and labor of the people within here. And that, also imprison people. And pre Oh, you know what? And uh, pardon me for forgetting. The, the government has power to do many things, but the yes. greatest check to government power, the only thing they're really afraid to tread on would be corporations. That's where they're consistently weak. On everything else, we have an unrelentingly powerful state. But on corporations specifically, we tread lightly. We wear kid gloves. And it's very, very painful. And I think that if we could tap into the wealth that we have let sit on the table for decades in this country, we would be capable of doing a tremendous amount of good with it. A lot of the weakness in this country, by the way, comes from an unwillingness for our politicians to not just act in the behalf of their people, but also to act with any coherent semblance of intellectual integrity, the Republican Party especially. Again, I think Trump should have invoked the War Powers Act. I think we should have had a full national lockdown, which we probably should have done and probably would have led to far fewer people dying than what we have currently today. Um, strength but, but in let me some go, instances... Go back to the point of, of what you're trying to say, if I get it right. Mm -hmm. You want people to be free, and it is your, your view that a strong centralized federal government is the best opportunity or best chance for that to happen. But then you've just told me how the government doesn't do anything well. And I look at, you know, I, I, and I look at corporations. Mm -hmm. And while corporations, large corporations, let me be clear, I make a big distinction between small business and multinational corporations. And not everyone does, but I do. And I think that small business is the number one way that we can have any success in this country, rebuild our nation, rebuild anything whenever there's a problem. A strong entrepreneur middle class, in my personal opinion, is the best answer for that. And I know people would fight me on that, but that's what I think is the number one thing. But I, large corporations have basically become the government in my view. They, they, they are hand in hand in every case. We, are, we don't have capitalism, we have crony capitalism. That's what we have, that's this what we do. This is capitalism. But then that's what it is. That's what we have. That is our current system. It is a corporatist system right now. And so why in the world would I want to give that more power when I've given it more power in general? Look at what government runs. Because I want the state to government have the power schools. to suppress the corporations. That would fix the yes, problem. Yes, but why would it? Right? Why would it? Right? Well, if I tax it more and I give it more money, right? If a dog, if, the, if a dog wants to chase a cat, if I make the dog bigger, it's still going to chase the cat. Because if I give a dog something, it's still going to chase the cat. The I've got to stop it from wanting to chase the cat first, don't if I? If the government taxes corporations more, it's being made more powerful because it's weakening corporations. The more money it siphons off the top, the more it grows strong and the more the top grows shorter. So, in that way, strengthening the government would make corporations weaker. Additionally, I'm not just a libertarian, I'm a libertarian socialist. It's not okay. just. 
It's not just about giving the government more power. It's about explicitly stripping corporations of theirs. And the government, as far as I'm concerned, only really needs to be strong because we have such a problem with corporations in this country. The only reason that I think a government is the solution to these problems rather than decentralized mutual aid networks or rather than, um, you know, uh, NGOs that are operating like in a community basis or rather than like cooperative structures is because corporations can dominate all of those systems effortlessly through the capital they've already accumulated. Unfortunately, the state is the only system that can reasonably be used to ameliorate that power imbalance. And at the moment, I think taking money from corporations would be a good way to start because we can use that money to some good. It's not like when money goes to the government, when the taxes get raised, a hundred percent of it goes to the military. There are initiatives that are done with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it, it's not perfect, not even close, but right. some good is done with it. And I think that we're actually in a really unique time right now because public opinion is shifting. Nobody likes corporations anymore, not properly. Everybody realizes mm -hmm. they're getting shafted some way or another. And I think that as that sentiment grows, there's going to be a greater and greater demand on the part of the American people for the government to really step up and take its proper role, that is to say, its role in regulating commerce for the good of the people, which it has utterly failed to do since the death of Delano Roosevelt and sometime thereabouts. Uh, and I think that would probably be what I mean when I talk about strength. Well, how about if I gave you a, an alternative? Mm -hmm. And instead of an alternative of the government physically trying to currently break up with its boyfriend or girlfriend, Right, which is what you're actually asking. You're asking the government to break up with its girlfriend or boyfriend, which it might do. I'm not saying it won't do it, but I'm just saying that's really hard to do. Or would you rather instead create an environment to where the small business owner, the little guy, has an advantage, and now they can grow from the bottom up? And I'll give you a small idea of what I brought up that you might to give you a, a, an idea of what I mean. Sure. I had an idea for New York State to create a law in New York State that if you decide that you are a small business owner and you will sell only within New York State, that you would be immune from all federal regulatory bodies. Now, for some businesses, that's not realistic, but for some it is. So you only have to worry about state uh, bodies, and that's it. No federal regulatory bodies at all. And if you did that, then you'd have an advantage over the larger corporations which have to follow all the larger rules for larger things. So giving a small business an advantage, small, and if they want to stay small, they can, but if they then want to explode and get bigger and better and stronger, then they would have time and prepare to deal with all the new regulations that be required for at a federal level. I'd be cool with tax this breaks for small businesses, but I feel like if you got rid of... Um all federal regulation for single state operation. You would, you, I don't know. There's probably some federal regulation that not every state has like child slavery or something. I, I just don't yeah. want to see somewhere in Wisconsin. They're like, oh, don't have to follow those anymore. And then we see like nine-year-olds in the, in the coal mines. But tax breaks yeah. I'm fine with though. And it must be said, small businesses are by definition less efficient than big businesses. If we reduce the power that large corporations have, if we encourage people to start buying local, buying small, that will decrease the purchasing power of the average American. Is that something that you'd be willing to shoulder? That people should be wait, able wait, can to- you, Can you say that again so I can be clear on what you're asking? Stuff's cheaper from Walmart than it is from a mom and pop, you know? The economy of right. scale makes it a lot easier for people to overconsume from mega right. businesses than it does from sure. small businesses. Is that something you think that you could accommodate for, or is that just a price of returning to a more economically no, ethical system? No, we do it now. I use the example in New York State, right? In New York State, a couple years back, we actually um, kind of reduced regulations on brewing. So alcohol regulations, which we shouldn't have anywhere near the amount that we have already. And the second we did that, we had a massive brewing industry pop up within New York State. Local breweries, home brews all across New York State. It's one of our, our, our best industries prior to the COVID lockdowns. And it was very common for New Yorkers to walk into a bar and to on their own decide to pay an extra dollar or two for a beer that was a local brew that they wanted. So I don't have to decide on that. I'll let the individual people decide if they want to spend an extra dollar for the beer. And you know they can if they want to. But would I make a rule of law? No. Would I be prepared to open up an environment to allow them to do that? 100% yes. What if, if you, you want to spend 25 cents for your crayons at Walmart, or 75 cents at the local, you know, Vouch's store, Vouch's store, fine, up to you, I don't mind. Well, the problem is they, <clears throat> we had that decision and mom and pop stores lost. All across America, especially in middle America, where there aren't as many places to buy stuff from, 
we mm-hmm. had those decisions. Walmart opened up shop in these places and they did what yeah. they do to crush competition. They underprice, yes. so they can drive all these small businesses out of business and then they raise their prices back up to their standard afterwards. It seems like yep. without some kind of perpetual government assistance, there's no way small businesses can survive in the long term. Unless we're talking restaurants, which will always operate on a local level because you can't supply sure. chain distribute like cooked pizzas. There's, you know, it's different in that space. And no, you know, no, like I local bars. With that. That no, 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 you're actually incorrect that. Franchises have already fixed that one already. Franchises have found a way to make even that happen. Restaurants go out of business and the owners now become the manager of the Domino's or the manager of the Denny's or the manager of the, the friendlies or whatever is the thing. So I think even that even works against restaurants. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, even with franchising, I would still consider that even if it's only owned by one person, it's still like big business because you're adherent to rules and regulations given down by the parent company. Um, Yes. And most franchise owners own more than one franchise. It seems like the inevitable consequence of economy of scale is that small businesses are no longer going to exist or they can only exist in some very narrow industries or as like in very walkable areas in like old town or downtown where people tend to have more money because they come there after they're done with work or whatever, which is unfortunate because small businesses definitely have that high personable element. But at the same time, it's that ruthless capitalism that has made our country so economically strong, which means that if we forego that process, eventually, probably within the next decade, China will overtake us, which I, I don't know what your feelings are on that necessarily, but it's definitely something that I'm concerned about. No, the, the, my point being, and maybe that wasn't a good example for you, I don't know if it was or wasn't, my point being, if I'm going to use the power of the state in some way, I would rather not try to have the state fight its, its lover in an attempt to try to break that marriage up, when I'd rather simply put a hotter person out there for them to go to instead. I'd rather create more options for them. I would rather, if I'm going to use the power of the state, then How I should it make use life it better for the average to, citizen, though. I think it would, and here's why I would say that. So you're clear on my logic behind this. If you want, and for those of you who care, um, I actually did a, a presentation on poverty at Queens College about two years ago. So I'm, you can Google Larry Sharp Queens Co- College poverty, and I did a, an hour and a half on libertarian solutions for poverty. And one of the solutions, not the only one, but one of them is more of an entrepreneurial mindset within poorer communities. You know, I grew up in a poor community in the South Bronx, and how did we get out? We got out when I was a teenager because my mother used to clean houses and, 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 um, and offices, and my father was a DJ on the side. Entrepreneurial spirit, extra work, our own little businesses on the side. I helped clean the apartments when I was a kid. I guess that would be the part of that child labor, slavery thing you were talking about. I guess I was part of that. So I did that as a kid, and that's how we made money. Entrepreneurial spirit was a big deal. We, and, and when I was in the Bronx in a kid, as a kid, girls would be braiding hair on the stoop and making money for it. Now, New York State, that's a license. It costs you $20,000 to do that. When I was a kid in the 70s in the Bronx, cabs didn't come to my neighborhood. So we had gypsy cabs. Some guy would paint one side of his door a different color, one, one door of his car a different color. We knew it was gypsy cab, and that's how we got around. Now you can't do that. You have a medallion now, or they try to beat up Uber or beat up um, Lyft now in my city. We're doing everything to crush the entrepreneur. And I think one of, and not the only, but one of the ways that you get people out of poverty is an entrepreneurial slash ownership mindset that a any, government can assist with that. How can any of them compete with big businesses? Uber now reaches pretty much every part of every major city. Um, yep. Yeah. We So like, I, I feel like the opportunities for like entrepreneurial spirit have really been squashed by the... Um, the expansion of these mega industries. And also, yes. like historically speaking, the entrepreneurial spirit has never been a, a sociologically reliable way of ameliorating poverty. Usually it's stuff like food stamps, WIC spending, social security, that fixes poverty. But at the end of the day, only so many people can be employers. Most people have to be employees. And as long as wages are kept low, that's not going to do anything for poverty long term. No, I'll touch two pieces to that. The first one is, yes, you're correct, but most of that, the reason why the entrepreneurial spirit has been trashed and been so hard is because government and its lover, big business, has gone out of its way for, to have regulatory capture to ensure that small businesses can't survive. That's the reason. Government and their lover corporations have done that for decades. But aren't we and both when fighting that the lover? Decades, it makes it happen. We're both fighting the lover then. I want to tax corporations more, which is against big corporations' interests. 
and you yeah. want to uh, prop up small businesses, which is also against big corporations' interests. I yes. feel like you're proposing an alternative that's been less proven to work, but also involves the same institutional challenges. We're still both of us are still going to have to work against corporate lobbyists, you know. Correct. But taxing and spending, I can point to stats: the the, the WIC spending, food stamps, that this stuff brings people out of poverty. It just snap brings them right out of poverty. Housing investments brings them out of poverty. Infrastructural projects brings them out of poverty. That works, you know? But then it's like, I mean, I'm not opposed to people starting small businesses. For now, we'll get you all come time. But um, uh, conceptually, I mean, I'm not no, opposed to it. It's just, I don't know if that fixes. You're right. We are both against the monopoly. I started that way. I'm against cartels. I'm against monopolies. They're a bad idea. Mine is voluntary. That's the difference. Yours is get the government at the top to stop punching people. And what I think is the government can't win that war. It doesn't want to win that war, and it can't win that war. Corporations will beat them because they're the same people. They're lovers. They're in the same bed. They're not gonna, you're not going to throw your, your husband or your wife out of the bed. You're just not going to do it. That's not how it works. I think we have to do the opposite way, which is voluntarily supporting the people who are smaller so they can come up and the Davids can beat the Goliaths. There are more, would there are more Davids not, than there are Goliaths. Why would corporations not also fight back against that? Of course they would, but it's a whole lot easier. I don't know how, especially since what I'm advocating for could be done in a single bill. A single bill that, B, directly impacts yep. Americans, that, C, they could directly see the rewards from, and, D, isn't, like, gate-kept behind those with the entrepreneurial spirit to maybe one out of every hundred build a new business, whereas yours would be a collection of different pieces of legislation of uh, yep. revolving around small business empowerment, which would, B, yep. not be immediately visible to or affect most Americans, and, C, at the end of the day, would only lead to a select few out of every neighborhood actually being able to start a small business, and, D, it would oppose the corporate interests anyway. I, I just, I don't know. I just, I like taxes, you know? They're Mine shiny. is a cultural change that I think is long-term and will actually work in the long-term. That's what I believe, because once you start finding options, here's what happens in corporate world. I know I've been in corporate world a lot of my life. I've been, I, I'm one of those trainers and consultants and coaches too. I do all that stuff. And what will happen is as the small business begin to grow, you will have defections, lots of them. And what is my example of this? female entrepreneurs in the 90s and 2000s. The glass ceiling was serious for them and they couldn't get past it. So what did they do? They saw opportunities and they went there and they started small businesses that began to grow. It's a bad reason. I wish that wasn't the reason why they did it. The glass ceiling's bullshit, but I'm just saying that's what happened. And they went off and did their own things. You, you will find defections. That's what you'll find. Yeah, but did this fix the wealth gap between men and women or was it just like a couple of women? Yes. Entrepreneurship what doesn't... Is it, what happened is you did see a lot more women in power because of it. It didn't fix the wealth gap, but there was absolute improvement. You find more women in the workforce. You found more women actually making right. more money. Women that in the workforce. I'm, I'm totally in favor of women in the workforce. But yeah. entrepreneurship, I don't know how that fixes these issues. At the end of the day, if you start a small business, which in America is mm -hmm. defined as a business with less than 500 employees, but obviously most small businesses aren't. I use, I use SBA, which is under 50. Under 50. Fine. That's fine. Probably more descriptive, more, more accurate yep. to what we're thinking of anyway. Um, yep. When we're talking about a small business, we're talking about an owner and then a bunch of employees. I feel like, if anything, we're just oh, replicating. Not necessarily. No, 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 no. Well, or we could do worker co-ops, which would be the route that sure. I would go. 100%. Don't okay. Well, I wait, hold on. Okay. You're red pilling me here. Hold on. I'm swallowing the pill. So... If we're talking about my, my issue here, I didn't know I was, I don't even know what red pilling is, but I'm glad it's I did it. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. So, oh, it's a good thing. Okay. The problem that I have, and I, I'm not backing off the tax thing, but the problem that I have with the concept of promoting small business entrepreneurship are three. First of all, I don't like small business owners that much more than I like big business owners, uh, because ultimately the systems of exploitation remain the same, albeit at a different scale. Um, second of all, they don't meaningfully impact like generational poverty. And third of all, I don't know how well they compete against big corporations in a way which is emboldening to the consumer and to the American market. In now I, I gotta write this down. Hold on, you gave me three things. I've, I, I, now you're making me think. Hold on. <laughs> but One, the, you but, said they don't help poverty. It doesn't. It doesn't address poverty. Small businesses still involve um, uh, uh, labor exploitation, and exploitation. They're less efficient than big businesses. But if less we, efficient. Okay. If we're talking worker cooperatives here, though. 
mm -hmm. then I don't know. See, the reason I like worker cooperatives is because I like democracy. I like, um, I like any system where people who work within it are represented in its leadership. Any system. Sure. I just, I love it. So if we're talking worker cooperatives, which are, generally speaking, a fairly stable and robust form of economic organization, we could be talking about the government subsidizing systems where people cooperatively form economic opportunities for themselves and their peers. And that could be, among other things, I think, a really good start to a culture of collective ownership in this country. I would be on board with that. Well, let me cover three of them and then, and then the co-op collective piece. Hmm? Um, the first thing is, I think entrepreneurship absolutely helps with generational um, poverty because you're able to transfer something down to somebody else. There's an idea of owning your business, owning your life, owning your work. And if you look at so many people who came to this country as immigrants, many of them began to grow. And one of the, 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 the example I'll give you, it, it is, it's definitely um, uh, just one example. But it's, you remember, I don't know if you ever saw Killer Mike did a, had a Netflix special, and he talked about trying to survive in Atlanta with only black-owned businesses. And Atlanta, as you probably know, is, is a heavily black-populated city. And so he tried to live, uh, and he couldn't do it, not even a day. And then he actually made this statement, and I do not advocate for this statement. I'm just telling you what he said. All right. He said, there were advantages to segregation. At least you had to have black businesses because you couldn't go to the white ones. So there had to be a black shoemaker and a black lawyer and a black diner and a black hotel because you couldn't go to the white ones. I'm not advocating for that. I'm just telling you what he said. And the point being, if you look at so many families, when they have moved out of poverty, many of the times it's, it goes through generations. The first one is some type of entrepreneur. Then the next is some kind of professional. The next generation, some kind of entrepreneur. Next generation, some kind of professional. That is a common trend throughout poor communities. So I do think that statistically, when you have more people owning businesses in smaller communities, you find better communities. I remember when I was a kid, you know, in the Bronx, I look now, no, no, almost nothing that's in my old neighborhood is owned by people in the neighborhood. It's all owned by people outside who have bought something inside, who purchased it and now own it. it they don't really own it in there anymore. It's, it's a different issue. So I do think it does help. It's not a panacea, right? It's not a cure-all, but I think it does help. Second, the exploitation. Yes, I think there's exploitation in all business. It does happen. Of course it does. But the difference is, if you're looking at a local level, if you're a guy, gal, I'm going to say guy because I'm going to talk about prison. If you're a guy who did time, right, and you did a year in jail, and you're coming out now and you're a felon, what are the odds of you getting hired by a big business? Slim. Background checks. No thank you. Not going to happen. Who's going to give you that chance? The guy whose dad went to school, you know, your, his dad went, you know, you went to school with the, with the guy and his dad runs the business, mom runs the business. That's where you find that small businesses, while they do exploit too, they also give people a chance. And that's the thing big businesses rarely do. Sometimes, but rarely. Very often, small businesses give people a chance and something else. A small business allows the person who's in trouble to see somebody who's like them be successful. And that image has value. Can I tell you how much image that has? I don't know. But it does have value. So there is some value in that, even though you're right. There's also exploitation. When it comes to a big business, you are only a number. That's it. Nothing else. I've hired and fired people. You are only a number. Small business, during the 2009 crash, I got my ass kicked and I had to fire my two employees. It still bothers me to this day. It still bothers me because it wasn't their fault. It was mine because I was failing. And I can't stand the fact that I, that I, and this is now 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and it still bothers me. That's small business. Big business, you're a number buy, there's your pink clip, pack your trash. And the last thing is, yes, they're less efficient. I agree. There's no way around that. But many people, they get their chance there and innovation often begins there. Innovation often begins in a small business. So I think there's value to that no matter what. The co-op piece. This, I think, more than anything else, is a cultural issue. The reason why co-ops often struggle is because the finance industry doesn't believe in them. The finance industry thinks they don't work, so they don't finance them. So now you, you have to get the finance industry to go, oh, this can work. The current systems of co-ops that we have now, I don't know if it's what you think of, they're not really working co-ops, but they're kind of co-op-ish. Things like, um, Credit unions, 
things like that, which are co-op-ish, those types of things, they still have a hierarchy when it comes to decision making. There's really no real democracy in those current co-ops. And that's what the finance industry sees now. And they're okay with that. As long as their guy's in charge and they can put pressure on their guy, finance is, is pretty much okay with that. So I think co-ops aren't bad. I'm not against co-ops at all. My issue is you have a cultural issue. I mean, I guess the closest thing to a co-op now we can find in New York is the co-op buildings, co-ops versus uh, condos. Co and almost everyone I know who's in a co-op would rather be in a condo, but they go in a co-op because it's cheaper. So they go into the co-op. For those who don't know, in, 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 if you have a condo building, you actually own the physical apartment. In a co-op, you actually don't own the apartment. You own the business that owns the apartment building. And a condo, you have more of your own rights because you own the actual property. In a co-op, it's all done by a board. It's far more democratic. And people can decide what to do with your property and those types of things, who you can rent to, those types of things. Most people don't like the co-op answer. They take it because it's cheaper but they'd rather have a, a condo. And I think it's about two to one in New York City, co-op to condo, I think. Did I, did I touch your issues? I hope I didn't no, ramble yeah, too much. No I, I, no, I did. So there are a couple of points here um, with regards to small business. Um, so when I, when I said exploitation, I meant in the Marxian sense of surplus labor, which is something that can't really be addressed vis-a-vis -vis scale and proximity to um, uh, the, the person for whom you work. Um, well, this is, I think, maybe a little bit subjective, I think that the ways in which um, workers get shafted by small business owners are different than the ways they get shafted by big business owners. You may be a number in a big business, but small business owners tend to be a lot more with the, uh, hey, I'll pay you next week, or the, hey, you know, mm. you've worked here two years, you think you could just stay an extra hour. A lot more of that, you know, your ability to capitalize on the emotional relationship. Whereas if you've been working at a Target, you're, you're managing, you're never, ever going to feel any emotional obligation to that manager. Yeah. But seeing a small business owner like hunched over a computer in the back office, and you can see them trying to make the bills come together, you see a person like that, there's a way greater threshold for exploitation. I guess the issue that I have with this, so... With So when we're talking like broadly and economically, we know that big businesses are more economically efficient in the sense that they are capable of producing more products and services with lower sure. overhead costs per unit. Um, that's just the economy of scale. It's inevitable. There's yep. no getting around that. Franchises have half addressed that because an individual mm -hmm. can own a franchise and throw a personal flair in. But at the end of the day, it's not really their business. It's right. they own a chunk of a bigger business. Um, right. which I, I don't know if it necessarily fixes the problem entirely. The main problem that I have is that this, I, I say this somewhat derogatorily, but I think that's accurate, bootstrapping mentality when it comes to addressing poverty has never seen the same kind of returns that you see with massive government investment, you know? Uh, when it comes to what do we want to do about like inner city economic problems, the solutions that have worked have always involved government expenditures, have always involved tax credits. Biden recently cut child poverty in half by introducing that, God, what was it? That like three or, or three and a half thousand dollar refundable child tax credit um, that you can refund even if you don't pay taxes at all. I mean, that's incredible. Um, stuff like that has measurable impacts on poverty, but the entrepreneurship model in the best case, the best case that you can get is an individual from a community, maybe one out of five, maybe one out of 10, mm -hmm. is sure. able to become a small business owner and the rest of them remain employees. And with the way small businesses work right now and with how hard they're being squeezed by big businesses, it's not like they're going to be able to pay higher wages than those big businesses either. Maybe marginally, maybe by a very small amount, but not significantly. Small businesses just aren't doing that well. I'm okay with subsidizing small businesses to some extent because I like neighborhoods being personal. That's the thing that I really agree with. I resonate with that even, even as a socialist, even if we're talking cooperatives or decommodified industry, you know? The idea that you can go to Denver, uh, Chicago, uh, Pensacola, uh, and Humboldt and see the same franchises in all four is exhausting. And nobody <laughs> likes that. People like local culture. Small businesses are how you build local culture. And I support them for that reason. And I am in favor of tax credits for small businesses, without a doubt. Though I do think there's going to be some pushback from big corporations on that. I mean, we'll see how difficult it is. Um, at the end of the day, I think I'm in favor with, with this program that you push as a supplement to certain economic problems, but not as a replacement 
for uh, greater taxation and for social service programs. I think that in accordance, the two of them can work well, in part because uh, opening a small business in an impoverished community isn't going to mean much if nobody in that community has the money to spend at that small business. Whereas if you have people receiving tax credits up the wazoo, they can spend it at those small businesses. It circulates through the economy, small business pays taxes, and at the end of the day, the state gets its hand back, but not before it's run through 80 people on the way. That velocity of money is very important. Because when money goes into big corporations, what does it do? It go you cash register, some guy in an armored car picks it up, it goes to a yep. bank somewhere, and then it spends 10 years in the Cayman Islands. No yeah. velocity. It does nothing. I agree. So Small businesses, you spend yep. five there, you pick it up, owner spends that five on an ice cream, ice cream guy, he works in a stall, he does that, da, da, da. it makes its way through yep. 80 times, the GDP explodes, everyone gets to use the money, and it stays circulating. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm, yeah. I'm agreeing with you on those pieces. I am. The, the issue is, again, all I'm saying is, I think there's other ways of giving people more money, right? I think if, again, my point is, if I can get corporations to pay for something, that they want to pay for anyway, then that's less taxation on my population, in which case then, you know, that no tolls on the bridges, right? Now, instead of paying three bucks for a subway ride, it's a buck 50. That's, a, that's, a, that's three bucks a day somebody's saving on a subway, one for the each way. I think you can get the same thing, cash in the hands of the people on the ground, which I agree with you, that's what I want. I want cash in the hands of people on the ground to get that commerce going so we don't have to raise the taxes anymore. I think there are ways you can do that. My other, my other concern in this is if you're, if you're doing the, the way the federal government does it, and, and here's my issue. I like your concept of we can just give them money. I'm actually not against that kind of bill. If you're going to say, you know what? Write a check. Fine. Let's. We, we had a problem. Still the economy. I don't love it, but I'm okay with it because I know we do it anyway. Big what check. I'm not okay with is the way we're doing it now, which is we're going to have a $2 trillion bill, but we're not taking $2 trillion, dividing it by 200 million households and writing a check for 10000 each. If we were doing that, I'd actually be okay with that. But I'm not okay with we're going to do a $2 trillion bill and we're going to fund government with it. And we're going to fund this with it. And we're going to fund that with it. If you're going to do a bailout, just do a bailout. If that's the answer, take $2 trillion, divide it by 200 million households. Or how many, I think they're 200 million. Whatever the number of households there are, divide it by that. There's the money. Go spend it. Enjoy. But what then, if the government... as they spend it, now they pay taxes on that. And that funds the government. What if the government is capable of providing um, services and products uh, more efficiently with the wealth that it takes from that infrastructure bill than it ever could just by giving money out. Like, I'll give you an example. Uh, for example, um, it costs more in general, like total, the total amount of wealth expended for a person to break their leg and go to the emergency room and have to pay there, you know, however many thousands they have to pay, than it does for the government to cover if they're a recipient of Medicare or Medicaid. Um, they break their leg, they go to the same hospital. The ability to tap into government funds there ends up streamlining the process. You see the same thing with food stamps as well, because the government, when, when you, the food stamps go down, the government is not paying like grocery store prices on the food that, that you're buying with it. You know, the government is benefiting from its own economy of scale. We're all just individuals on our own, but the government is capable with its money of influencing a lot more good. Uh, housing development would be another one. You know, you want to, Say you want to invest uh, one billion in like housing development in the suburbs of Detroit. That's great. You know you can do a lot of good there. But if you split that one billion up amongst like all the people in Detroit, and you were like, "Hey, go," you know, if you need housing, good luck. You know, I don't know if that would solve the problem in the same way. It would. It would dissolve. But we need targeted solutions, and I think that's why they streamline where this money goes in these in these big bills. You know. Then I, I get. I get what you're saying. You're saying that it, you know, government can do it better. My, my answer is I don't think government ever has done it better. We can I go back to back in Washington. You know? that it does it better. What about so, that? Back to back, all right? You and me back to back, all right? Shoulder to shoulder. You're fighting for small businesses. I'm fighting for taxes. Nary do we make eye contact, but we're, we're working together anyway, okay? It's like the scene from the movie. You know what I'm talking about? I love it. I love it. Do we both have two guns or what? What do we have? Two not, pistols wait, each? No, not, I disavow. Not in Washington, we don't. No, we don't. We are, uh, <laughs> yes. got our not finger guns out, to. okay? Now, Absolutely. I've actually been accosted by Secret Service before in Washington. Um, very, very wow. jumpy, these guys, you know? 
I was recruited by the CIA, so I don't know if that's the same thing or not. They're probably no, also I pretty no. jumpy. I, I, I did say no, but yes, I was recruited by the CIA. No, um, I guess what I wh where I'm going with this is I do think that we can tap government in a certain way. Let me give you my idea to make better health care. You mm -hmm. talked about health, let me give you my idea for this. You have people on Medicaid, Medicare. Actuaries right now already know. They have you in a box on about how much money you're going to spend per year, depending upon where you fit in their actuarial box, age and pre this they know. Mm -hmm. For the sake of argument, I don't know what your number is, but your number is $3,000 per year. They know you're probably going to spend that if you're on you're on government-funded um, uh, health care. So they give you a debit card. And they said, there's 3,000 bucks. You got it on the debit card. Spend it any way you want, anywhere you want. But you just spend 3,000 bucks. Now, what happens if you run out of 3,000 bucks? Well, you fall back to regular Medicaid. It's okay. You can still, you still get it. The, 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 the you know, safety net is still there. But you have an option of just taking this card and swiping it at any place you want so that you can get medical help. What will most people do? Most people will change nothing because most people don't. But there will be some early adopters who will say, you know what, so I can go to the cool doctors in New York City? Yeah, you can. Just go there and swipe. No, nothing. Just It's like a credit card. You don't have to have insurance, nothing. Just go there and swipe. And you can do it if you want to. What will happen? What I think will happen, and I think you can find this to be true, it happened, I think it was in Oklahoma. I forgot where. There's a local success story on it, and I'm hoping we can bring it to a state. And I would hope to bring it to New York State if I could to take care of some of the damages that we pay in our Medicare and Medi uh, Medicaid damages we pay in New York State. It's over $60 billion every single year. So now what will happen? The two-tiered system that we have right now, particularly in New York City, again, I don't know, I speak for where I am. In New York City right now, it's a two-tiered system. You have Medicaid, Medicare, anything like that. There are a level of doctors who will take it. And if you go to one of their facilities, there's two doctors maybe and probably four administrators. And they care more about photocopying your stuff than about who you are. They don't remember you fill out forms every single time. It's a disaster. Your appointment's at 3 o'clock. You get seen at 4.30. You have to see you for 10 minutes, and you walk away. That's a common occurrence in most people who do that with that in the city. Then it's the second level, which is the people who are wealthy. Those people don't, don't – their doctors don't take any insurance. Those doctors you go when you write them a check, sort of a credit card. In that case, you show up at 2 o'clock. You're seen latest 2.05. The doctor actually talks to you and says things like, Okay, so how are you sleeping? How are you eating? What are your stress level? They spend 20 minutes, 35 minutes with you sometimes. Why? They got paid. You swap, you swap your credit card or you gave them a check. Now, once doctors see that they can just get that without all the admin, because in that doctor's house, a doctor's facility, there's five doctors and two administrators, not two and five. It's reversed. So they're going to start saying, wait a minute. So I can get government money if I just lower my prices and get people here? Yeah. They'll start marketing to that type of person. And you'll start getting people who understand what good health care is about. And now poorer people will be able to experience better health care. Well, that should bring all the prices down and give everyone an opportunity to start seeing what good health care is about. Sure, but Not just health care, it's enough. We know what good health care looks like. All you have to do is go to any of the government-run health care systems and the social democracies that we have in Europe, and they blow us out of the water. I feel like health care is one of the perfect examples of my point. That's an industry where commodification doesn't seem to work too well because uh, there there isn't um, what's the term again the um, the uh, 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 demand flexibility ch chat help me the demand flexibility the um, the 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 price elasticity thank you chat the elasticity um, uh, doesn't really function that well you want to have a good elasticity of demand for a commodity because you want people to want it less if it costs more and vice versa. But there's no limit to how much people will pay for good health care because the alternative is in many cases death. So for that reason, um, the inelastic uh, demand for health care means that the market system doesn't function too well with it. All of the best health care systems the world around are run by governments where they just take in tax money, they put it into the system, they pay their doctors, they pay their administrators, and that's all they have. Like that's that's where there it are, settles. There are two issues that we have to worry about here. Oh, wait, the I just, one well, there's is... one other thing I wanted to say because okay. um, go ahead. I, I actually had a question. Maybe you can – because I have to go soon because we're running on the two-hour mark. So I wanted to, to ask, hypothetically, I think that everyone deserves to eat food. Seems important. You know, I've never tried to go without it. Feel like I'd have an issue. Um, how would you feel – ignore the practicality, conceptually. 
What if we have our grocery marts, but we also have a couple per city, you know, just every once in a while, we have these government run like food bodegas and they run basically like grocery stores. They're paid for by your taxes and you just get a stipend of food from there if you come in, you know, you have your SSN, you run on in there. Oh, you haven't been here this month. Okay. How much do you got? Oh, okay. You have 27 points of food you can get. You can run around, you can get potatoes, olive oil, have your fun. And it's free. You just get your monthly, whatever amount you want. Do you think that something like that would be a good idea? Because the benefit conceptually would be that the government can buy up all these foods at way lower prices than we could buy them from at a grocery store. So by therefore, our tax dollars are being spent more efficiently than our dollars could be spent if we were to just go to a commercial outlet. Would you be in favor of a concept like that? Maybe not in practice, but an idea like that. Only if it wasn't Monopoly. So I mean, if there are other, uh, like, corporate grocery stores around, that works too? Or even nonprofits. Okay. Or even nonprofits. If I have to go to the government, it's going to be a Monopoly, and it's going to give me bad service, because that's how it works. But when you actually have other op opportunities, things begin to get better. They just do. I mean, even Yang, Yang's running for governor, I'm the governor, for, for mayor of my city. And he's about UBI, he's about all types of government interference. Even he says, look, when you have Monopoly, it's not so good. Elon Musk, when you have Monopoly, not so good. Lots of people talk about Monopoly being bad. So if you're saying, would I be open to an idea of a government supporting the poor in general? I think if you're talking about the any people who couldn't afford it, they could come go get yeah, food anyone for could free. Just go on, yeah, just go on by. As long as you're a citizen, you can go ahead and... You know what? Not even if you're a citizen. Just we'll we'll find a way. We're we're in concept land over here. But you can you can get your your monthly allotment. If I if I thought there was a way we could do it, I would. And you know how I would actually do it if I could. Hmm? And I know that it will drive you crazy. Hmm? I would sponsor it. That's how I would get rid of tax base. I would sponsor it. I would allow the 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 local developer who's building housing in the area to sponsor it. Throw me an extra ten grand a month. You can sponsor it. It's Jones Developers food pantry or whatever you want to call it food store whatever you want to call it and it's free food if you have the the government can still run it right the government can still run it they still you know you get your points from the government but again if i have a way of getting someone else to pay for this versus taxes i'm always going to go that route and I then mean, if i can also then support local communities from doing it i would also like i would like the person who is in trouble who's in food insecurity to not have to go to the government but be able to go to the government. Right, well, but I'm not talking about monopolization. Go. I'm just saying it's an option in these cities. I, I mean, I feel okay like at this point, we might as well just sell ad space on every single square inch of government property, right? I mean, um, like, we can, we can have the, the White problem? House with, like, uh, you know, with the, the Riot Games in. logo emblazoned I'm on in. the front. I mean, you could GameStop, be it. So wait, that's what it is. We didn't even GameStop get the, on the house. We didn't even get the touch on that. But just, just so my opinions know, because this is more of a a qualitative point. But I would, I would kill myself if I lived in a society with a precedent like that. Unironically, in real life, in a video game, Twitch, in a video game, but in real life, hypothetically, in such a society, I really don't like commodification, just in general. And the idea of every square inch of public land and space being plastered with advertisements rather than just taxing corporations sounds dystopian to me. You know, I, I actually think the opposite. I think that it wouldn't be that bad because we'd pick and choose the things that matter. And if you had too much, it wouldn't be valuable anymore. Right? If, if everything is plastered, then everything becomes invisible. It all becomes, and marketers know this, it all becomes decoration. Then it doesn't become that's an actual what happened. marketing. That's what already happened. So. If you walk it in is, any so major inner city area, every, pretty much Thank everything, you. apartment blocks have like ad, like signs vertically that stick out from them. The banners hanging yes. from streetlights, cars have Which ads on them. Which is why corporations are happy to do something else and do something different. That's the reason why, because of what you just said. They absolutely will do other things. They're open to other ideas because of what you just said. I would just, the I would rather just tax them than have them paint the planet. I just don't like, I don't know. It just feels like the long-term consequence of this is, is devastating. We already know there are psychological consequences to the over-prominence of ad space, whether that be yeah. while watching digital media or walking through physical areas. And I feel like there's something almost priceless about a beautiful like inner city district that we have essentially commodified and sold for pennies on the dollar to, uh, to corporations, often not even for government 
profit so that they can use those tax dollars for something good, usually just because we have very lax laws when it comes to how thoroughly you're allowed to decorate the, uh, you know, the sky. Yeah, we, we've exploited our poor communities in this zone tomorrow. I completely agree. But I think there's the, the way I feel is better is by having more ownership in, in general, right? The, the pieces I brought up, and I'll, I know we're short on time. I'll touch quickly your healthcare piece and then Mount the last Rushmore. piece in ownership. You can have all of Mount Rushmore. See we will, that? We can make that. Ads, um, it'll look I like think a. The Native Americans might be angry about that one. A graffiti so, wall, okay? There's the whole thing. Like oh, we'll see. The Native Americans be angry, though. No, they um, don't like. I don't think Native Americans like that. I think they might appreciate. I know, they'd probably want that back. They wouldn't want me to put some freaking McDonald's sign on it. They'd want it back. Hmm. I'll so, have to ask. Well, I'll ask the tribal that. trust. Okay. We'll, we'll find there out. we go. We'll see if they'll deal with it. My 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 thing on healthcare, as I was going to bring up, is right now in most of those European countries, what you actually have is a two tiered system. Also, like you have in New York City, the wealthy have supplemental insurance or rich people insurance. That it's all it's often, and I'm not against that idea. Right, but we have to realize that that's going to happen here too. If we have a Medicare for all or something like that, one of the reasons why so many of the wealthy people don't care about Medicare for all, whatever the case may be, is they're not going to use it. They're going to use whatever form that they want to use. They're going to have supplemental insurance or whatever the case may be, or just pay in cash, as they often do. So that is my worry about you know a, a system like that. That the problem is the customer becomes the government, and the customer isn't the individual. And we don't have a good culture of this. And I go back to culture. A lot of things you're talking about, our culture just fights against. We don't like this. We fight against it. We don't have a culture of that. The Scandinavian countries have a different culture when it comes to being communal. They're also smaller. I mean, all of Scandinavia is like Texas. I mean, that's like all of Scandinavia. It's like 5 million people in, what, 5 million in Norway, 5 million in Finland, 5 million in Denmark, 10 million in, in Sweden. I don't know how I know that. But anyway, that's about what it is. So it's about 25 million people. It's the same as Texas. So they also have a more homogenous society. Finland is the most homogenous, I think, except maybe Japan. Japan and Finland are two of the most homogenous societies on the planet. So when you have those types of environments, it's easier. I'm not saying your plan can't work. I'm saying you're going to find a lot of pushback. And culturally, it simply isn't who we are. We destroyed ourselves by linking um, 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 health insurance to our businesses after World War II because of our stupid government intervention. If we hadn't have done that, I think we'd be in a better spot. Well, corporations so lobbied for that, to be fair. That wasn't like the, the will. So I, I just want to say, just as a counter to that, diverse neighborhoods are actually more likely to push for unionization. And um, yeah. social welfare programs and like civic projects are more common and more advocated for in more diverse neighborhoods. I feel like if there's any like... Um, any like cultural divide thing that like really fucks America up. It's probably the rural urban divide, which transposes relatively yes. well onto the Republican Democrat divide. I don't know Absolutely. if like communities that have racial diversity have problems with policy because of that diversity. It's usually economic problems that stem from like longstanding issues. And then yeah. it gets sort of bled into a bunch of other things. Um, uh, that's I something agree. that I want. I we can get more data on that. Um, yeah. So, okay, we're on the hour now. Uh, I actually really, really appreciated this conversation. Uh, the time that you took to uh, to share with me. It's not often that I get to talk about these ideas. I appreciate it, and I, and I hope that um, maybe maybe one day we'll be fighting on the same team. I hope so. Back to back. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> there uh, we go. Yes. I appreciate it. I, I'm really glad we got this together. It was a great conversation. Uh, guys, don't forget to check out The Sharp Way. That's sharp with an E. Uh, you can just Google that. And uh, if you enjoyed this, please check out discord.gg slash bluepolitics. Vosh, as always, thank you for coming on. Yeah, I had a wonderful time. Seriously. Uh, thank, um, thank you again, uh, Mr. Sharp. Please have a wonderful day. I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, we'll, we'll get Mount Rushmore, okay? We're going to do it. I don't care who's mad. I think everyone will be mad, all right? <laughs> We're going to make that the most garish neon graffiti spot uh, in there all of human history. Sounds good to me. Take all care, right, okay? Good seeing you. Likewise. Bye.